speak or combine for their impact fee. Um, and you can see the impact fee for this one's particularly high because there's only 133 uh, remaining developable acres. So if we were to go with just a direct flow rate 53 cost, it would be 50,000 per acre. Next, we have the Irondale watershed. So you can see that there's only 435 remaining developable acres in Irondale. And we have started purchasing um, land so that we can you know, start building these regional ponds. Uh, the master plan basically calls for a 60 inch pipe from Highway 2 all the way out to the South Platte. So no crossing underneath the O'Brien, no crossing under I-76, and really no infrastructure west of I-76 for Irondale. And so the cost per impervious acre or cost per acre for Irondale is right around 55,000 per acre. Next, we have the First Creek drainage basin. Um, you can see that we only have 13 35 remaining developable acres in First Creek. Uh, we have what we call the Mall Reservoir, which is a large regional pond that needs to be built. Uh, no crossing of the O'Brien Canal, Havana, I-76, 104th, US-85, and First Creek ultimately ends up in the large channel that's in Bell Creek. And so the cost for First Creek is right around 63,000 per acre. Next, we have Second Creek. And so Second Creek, we basically need two large regional ponds, um, quite a bit of channel work along Second Creek. Um, we need a crossing of the O'Brien Canal, and we need to construct a drainage channel north of the O'Brien Canal because it doesn't currently exist. And so you can see that cost is right around 36,000 per, per acre. And our last one is Third Creek. And you can see that we have Quite a bit of developable land left in 30, Third Creek at 3720 developable land left. Um, there's no regional ponds in Third Creek, and so we really have crossings of Himalaya, um, Tower Road, uh, the O'Brien Canal, the Burlington Ditch, uh, Buckley, and I believe that's Cameron Drive to the west. And so that cost is only 14,000 per acre. And so this slide basically shows uh, the amount of fees that we've currently collected. So with our, with our fees, we've collected about $1.7 million. Um, we have a capital need of right around 326 million, which leaves us with a shortfall of right around 324 million. And so the one thing I wanna note that is if we continue our fees as they currently are, we'll collect about $17 million more of drainage impact fee, which will leave us a shortfall of right around 307 million. So we're recommending that the city adopt a per acre fee for each basin. And basically this chart shows, you know, that it shows the current impact fee and the, and the jump for the proposed impact fees. And you can see it's quite a bit. Um, and obviously First Creek and Irondale, there's no existing fees for those particular drainage basins. And there's probably less developable land in First Creek and Irondale. And so the final slide is um, if all this infrastructure gets built, we think there'll be about a million dollars worth of operation and maintenance needed for all this infrastructure. And I did wanna note that in 2013, uh, a stormwater utility fee was proposed to city council. And at that time they decided not to adopt a fee. I guess I'm not suggesting that we have a utility fee at this point, um, really wanted to focus on um, updating uh, the impact fees um, for each of the drainage basins. And I guess, um, I guess the next slide is um, discussion and any questions from council. Okay, thank you very much for that presentation. Does anybody on council have any questions for Mr. Sarderlin, Council Member Noble? Council Woman Noble appears you're muted. I am, you're right, thank you so much. Um, who is it who winds up paying the fee? Is it only new 
uh, the owners of new properties or does everyone wind up paying it in some? So it, it would be the, yeah. So it would be the owners of the new properties. So it's really a fee for, when I said developable acres, I meant the remaining amount of land within those drainage basins that could develop. Thanks. It's paid at the time of permit when the permit is issued. So when a builder comes in for a building permit, they would be the one paying it at that time. Any other questions or comments? Council Member Hurst. So if we adopt this, how are we expecting people to move into our city? I mean, the house prices are gonna to continue to soar. That's not just something that a bank or a developer eats the cost of, and, and we're talking several million dollars more per development. So I guess I can give an example, if I, if I may, Mayor. I did check, um, for example, Reunion Ridge currently is paying about $350 per lot for their drainage impact fee. And it would be about 10 times that if um, we adopted this new fee structure for a direct flow area 53. So it'd be in the $3,000 range per lot. Every just saw a report every thousand dollar raised on a house, we lose about 60,000 people qualified to buy that house in Colorado. Councilmember Wadiola. What are the comparables of other cities? What, are the, what do they charge? I think that's important because definitely hear what Council Member Hurst is saying, but what are what is Thornton, Northland, Brighton? What are their fees on this? Sure. So I, I I pulled Brighton because I thought they were probably more similar with us. I mean, we have I say I guess our the city's biggest problem is that we have all these um, obstacles for our drainage ways, right? We have the O'Brien Canal, we have the interstates, and there's currently no there's no crossings of those. So um, I did pull Brighton, and they charge. $4,580 per single family residential unit. And then for multifamily, it's 2310 per unit. And then for non-residential units, which would be our industrial and commercial, <clears throat> they charge 86 cents per square foot of impervious area. Um, and back in our slide, I believe ours was right around 68 cents per impervious area for just an average throughout the city. Okay, so there, theirs are higher and people are still moving over there, right? So, okay. Yeah, and I will add that, you know, Brighton was sued because they had a lot of retention ponds. And during 2013, they had a lot of flooding because the ponds basically reached their capacity and flooded some residential neighborhoods. Thank you. Council Member Hurst. Yeah, all, all of those are higher, but their house average is still not. So of course people are gonna move in. I'm not suggesting we don't resolve or look to resolve the issue. Obviously drainage is very impactful in the environment that we live in today. I, I would love to find solutions, but you know, even, even some pretty um, left leaning reports are saying we must build 55,000 houses a year in Colorado in order for us to become anywhere close to attainable. And we've nowhere in the history of Colorado ever come to attain that clip. So I'm just looking for ways that we can keep teachers and police officers and firefighters to afford. I was looking today at our average home price for the last month and it's over $485,000 in Commerce City. So for me, that's what my concern is. You get the 500, you remove an entire class of people from being able to ever afford a house in our town anymore. I know we live in a metro. I know that's the market. 
still doesn't mean we should continue to pile on to that because I'm here to tell you, we have a lot of good people in this town and the reason that they, can, they moved here is because it was attainable and affordable at the time. And if we continue moving away from that, it's no longer gonna be that type of town. Councilmember Madera. I think this is a tough discussion, right? Because we have to address the issue and you know, we all always circle back to Metro districts and how's this being done right now is being done by Metro districts and those fees that impact people just the same. So just because the cost isn't necessarily reflected in the home price, doesn't mean that people aren't paying for it. They're paying for it in their taxes and you know, that always comes back to us as a city so, you know, I think this is a more accurate depiction of what the house is actually costing homeowners. So I, I'm on board of, you know, we have to update this. We, we need drainage and it's gonna get charged one way or the other. And, you know, at least this way, you know, it's being transparent and upfront about, you know, what those costs are. Mr. Tinklenberg. Thank you, sir. Yeah, the tough choice is either it's uh, tax revenues that have to pay for it, or it's the impact fee that has to pay for it. So, you know, one way or another, it's costing people to pay for it. And uh, the impact fee is designed to be borne by those that are coming in by, by the home price, by the developers. Um, so that's the choice. It, it's either we do it that way, or we have to either use general fund tax revenues or one of the general improvement districts tax revenues. And it can be a combination of those certainly, but that's the tough, tough choice for all of us. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mayor. I, I think just adding on to both Roger and Brent's uh, discussions earlier. Uh, you know, these are very tough conversations that we are going to, to have to have. Obviously, the, the price of the houses, uh, as we're seeing in the market, will continue to in, in, increase. Uh, so I don't discredit what Council Member Hurst uh, has, has noted there. Um, and I would say, you know, what we're finding is a representation of the impact fees from Mr. Soderlin is I would say our lack of introspective review of those fees over the course of the last 20 plus years. Now there's there's good and bad to that, right? The, the bad is that, right, it's been an opportunity from a, a formulaic approach for development to continue to keep moving forward at a, at a rather uh, quick pace in Commerce City, which has allowed for uh, other benefits to, to be delivered. While at the same time, it's put us in a position now that we are having to look at becoming more sophisticated with our operations and making sure that development pays its way, uh, that right we have to accelerate those fees at a significant rate. Um, the one thing that, that Brent or Mr. Tinklenberg hadn't shared is right, there's different ways of how you approach in the introduction of those fees. Is it phased over time? Is it one at a time? But you know, if you look at it from a phased approach, you, you have to make sure that you have escalators within that to make sure that you're keeping up the cost of the infrastructure necessary to support overall development. So just, there's ways of being able to look at the introduction of that um, with respect to how you continue to remain competitive overall, but also respecting that, right, we have to get to this point to assure that, right, we have the right infrastructure for existing and future development for the benefit. And I'll allow Brent to speak more about that if he has more clarity from his efforts with respect. Well, and I was gonna say, Jesse, I don't believe that we looked at a phase approach. I mean, that's certainly something that would probably make it more palatable to the development community. Um, I guess it just kind of delays the inevitable, I guess, in, in my opinion. Um, you know, we have basically $300 million worth of infrastructure that we need, and um, how do we pay for it? Brent, could I add something? Sure, Jesse. 
the the fees that Brent discussed are um, in 2021 dollars, just in case there was any doubt about that. And the we we gave Brent a, a pretty detailed report that he summed up nicely in the slides. But in that report, we we recommended that each year those fees would have to be to be escalated up to account for um, what was just said about about that. Um, we did very briefly look at at some some different funding mechanisms um, like a drainage impact fee and, and how you might assess that. We didn't go into too much detail uh, with that. The phase approach, um, I, if that would be kind of an annual, would that be kind of an annual fee on top of an impact fee? Like whatever your development owes, you pay 50% of it with development and then so much every year after that. I don't know. Um, but I just wanted to clarify the, the where the dollar amount came from or the year that it was the fiscal dollar, fiscal year that that was uh, associated with. Councilmember Noble. Um, I think uh, Brent, you've touched on it. Jason, you touched on it. Uh, Roger touched on it, which were various options. And um, before any decisions are made, I would uh, personally like to see what those combinations could be, one, two, and three, whether it's uh, improvement district plus a fee, uh, the fee alone, phase fee, whatever that looks like in order to catch up on our infrastructure. It's uh, never a good idea to kick the can on infrastructure, that's for sure. I've lived in uh, flood areas before and it's not a good plan. And we do have flooding issues in this area, even though it seems quite dry presently, but anything that you can do to help us make the decision that will be best for um, our residents and also more particularly for future residents to make um, Commerce City continue to be um, a quality home for a lifetime. Thanks. Councilmember Hurst. Yeah, I just <clears throat> I guess I should clarify. I in no way suggest that development stops if we do this. I just talking about where the, the cost gets passed on to. And so I guess one of my concerns is and, and hey, if 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 it was currently being done in a metro district and we were funding it that way and we were getting everything we needed, I, I might I might look at this. Let's talk about putting it up front and let's talk about um, you know, not extending that that debt you know, 30, 40 years down the road. I still think we have to solve this, but I really have to think we, ha we have to start looking at some of those overall impacts in other areas then because we are going to price ourselves out what, what we're looking for, I think. And, um, you know, studied up on, on a topic for later, looking at Fort Collins and we cost as much as Fort Collins does. And, and honestly, we're a different phase of, of our city growth than they are. And so I'm not sure we should cost as much as them. And so there's just a lot of things that I think we have to consider. It doesn't take long for me to look around the neighborhood and understand that drainage is the most important thing to preserving our, our homes because of the 2013 flood and everything else. I want us to do this right. I want us to, to get, get what we need. What I'm concerned about is if we're collecting this fee, how are we ensuring that every project by prioritization is being done on time and on budget at that current scale. Cause we just heard, you know, those advising us that that's gonna have to go up every single year. So what do you think that's gonna force? A build now mentality. If I may, Council Member Hurst, I, I, I hear you, and like so, we can I think paint an overall picture of pros and cons with respect to uh, the updating of the drainage fees as a kind of, uh, for lack of better words, whole cost, and or through a through a through a phase approach. I would share, and and Brent, please correct me if I'm wrong, or keep me underneath the table if if I'm misspeaking, but. Right, the increase over year over year would not be as significant given that, right, we'll be at the level of even, I would call it even playing field for the necessary impact to be mitigated that, right, we're not going to see that kind of 
per unit cost that may be at two to three thousand jump to six thousand in for just a, a rough scenario. So right, we won't be having this kind of sticker shock as it may be uh, with respect to to the night's numbers. But Brent, you may be able to elaborate more on that. No, I, and you know we kind of had brought up metro districts, and you know the metro districts are really, I guess funding the storm sewer and the streets and the sidewalks within their um, developments. Um, we haven't really pushed them in the past to do the regional type improvements. Um, I will say that um, the Reunion Ridge development did put in a regional pond for us. Um, I believe that Turnberry is also gonna put in a regional pond on Henderson Creek. So I guess there are some of those costs that could be offset um, but I guess, you know, we're at three, 307 and maybe that knocks it down to 250 or something like that. I mean, there's still, um, the biggest cost, for example, on second Creek would be that regional pond at 112th in the O'Brien canal. Um, I believe it's like a 237 acre foot pond. Um, we have to do a really fancy crossing there because the O'Brien canal has a water right. And then we also have to build the channel north of there. So, I mean, you know, we're, we're just, we're looking at large costs, I guess. And I was shocked when we did the, when we looked at the study also, so. Any other comments or questions? Can I just finish, uh, like respond to that, please? Uh, so, so, you know, again, I'm not trying to come off like I don't support this. I just want us to understand that I understand the costs that we're talking about, Brent, and that's what that's what I mean is is you know three hundred million dollars is expensive no matter what year the money's printed, um, and so I want us to do that right. I want us to be able to prioritize those dollars in a way that we get the most for them, and we may need to take on big projects real soon because it's not getting cheaper. To do, to do these types of projects, the next seven to 10 years, that 300 is easily gonna turn to four or 375 if I'm being nice, you know? And so that's really, that's my concern. And Jason, I, I, I hear you loud and clear. We're not gonna see a, you know, a thousand percent jump year over year. I, I mean, I really hope not unless something crazy happens. We'd be looking at maybe a, you know, 5% or 8% raise year over year just to stay in. Um, with inflation and, and increasing costs, so I get I get all of that. I just want us to understand the the, the whole outfall of you know this type of stuff. We need this in in North Commerce City and in parts of South Commerce City, the Irondale, no doubt, hundred percent. It's flooded there in the past. It'll flood the flood in the future. We need to be able to man, manage that. But we also have to look at the bigger picture, and I'm not staying the city's not i just have to have that you know we have to talk about that in public that's fair sir thank you mr tinglenberg so if i'm reading the sentiment of council correctly and i want you to correct me if i'm wrong um it sounds like bring this back but bring you some options in terms of timing and phasing and um you know, sort of the interplay with some of the other funding mechanisms. Is that a fair summary? Seeing some heads nod. I believe so. Okay. All right, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Well, thank you very much for the presentation. I think uh, it's good information. I think it shows the dire circumstances that we are in whenever it comes to this funding and the lack of funding stream. You know, I, I understand the fact that whenever you pass an impact fee, it starts to price people out of being able to purchase a home in your community. But I also can contrast that to the flip side of if we don't pass an impact fee, then we have to tax the residents who currently live here. And so at what point do we risk taxing the current residents out of their homes because they can no longer afford their property taxes because we had to pay for these projects in order to support new development. So I think it's important that we're looking at this holistically and figure out the best way to move forward. Next up, we are going to have a presentation on the environmental consulting services phase one check-in. We'll invite Dominic Martinelli, environmental planner to introduce the topic.
Thank you, Honorable Mayor and City Council. Um, tonight, we're gonna be doing a um, phase one check-in for the Environmental Consulting Services Project. And before we get into that, I'm just gonna give kind of a brief summary and overview of, of where we are and how we've gotten to this point. So in October of uh, 2020, the city put out a request for proposals for an Environmental Consulting Services RFP. Um, the process of selection um, and then negotiating executing contract put us into February to getting a new environmental consultant in place. And this presentation is essentially going to be a brief overview and assessment of the first six months of that project and some of the deliverables that have been completed and essentially where we're at now and where the project will go from here. Um, so just kind of a brief assessment and I'll introduce the environmental consultants in a little bit, um, but a lot of the work and, and just to kind of brief for tonight, thinking about kind of the process of determining policy is the first step is really getting an understanding and a sense of you know where we're at, what data do we have, what can we generate and what can we sort of tell about the story from a quantitative perspective. And then from that point, so you're gonna have more conversations and discuss you know what potential directions can go from that. Um, and then one of the other components of a lot of the information that we'll be looking at tonight is through a number of um, processes, including the um, the, the settlement process that occurred at the Suncor refinery through the Colorado Public, Pu Public Health and Environment. There's been a lot of information and requests for fulfilling a community need for more data and more information and more transparency and things of that nature. Um, in conjunction with all these efforts, the city has also convened an environmental policy advisory committee um, with them essentially intending to be one of the main driving forces and, and sort of working together in tandem um, to further environmental justice with the community and, and things of that nature. Um, so a lot of the information that we'll be discussing tonight um, will essentially kind of be the main information in helping to guide through that process appropriately. And then ultimately we'll get to the final portion of this presentation um, and kind of review the data and the, uh, the information that's presented and get any additional directions and guidance from you all kind of at this initial checkpoint of you know, where, where should we be going from here? What are some other thoughts? Um, questions, concerns, and comments. Um, and one last thing that I, I do want to share before we um, introduce the consultants is on the city's website, we did publish today, um, prior to the commencement of this meeting, the greenhouse gas inventory um, and air quality impacts assessment. So if you go to c3gov.com slash environment, you should see two new pages up there that will have all the information that was included in the packet tonight as well as full copies of the greenhouse gas inventory and the air quality impacts assessment and some more information. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and uh, introduce Julia Newman to uh, give this presentation. Thanks so much, Dominic, I appreciate it. Um, and I think you'll be screen sharing for me, correct? That is correct. All right, great. So let me know um, so, when you yeah. can see that. Yeah, all good, coming up now. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you so much to the members of the council um, and uh, the city and um, residents for having us here this evening to provide this update. We are um, very excited and, and grateful to be participating and supporting this work, uh, this really important work at the city. Um, my name is Julia Newman. I'm with Lotus Engineering and Sustainability. I'm our Managing Director of Communications and Engagement, uh, and I'm the Project Manager and Project Lead for um, all of the different components of the ECS contract. Um, Dominic, I think you can switch forward a couple of slides. So I uh, just wanted to give you a brief overview of our team's expertise. Um, as Dominic mentioned, there are several different components of this project. Um, so we do have, in addition to the Lotus team working on this work, we do have a couple of um, other uh, expert firms and that we're grateful to have as partners on this project as well. Um, so the Lotus team that I represent, we really provide greenhouse gas accounting and modeling expertise. Um, we are local government uh, sustainability and climate action planning experts as well. So we've supported the development of sustainability plans, climate action plans, um, and different uh, sustainability and climate action related programs and and policies uh, throughout local governments in, in Colorado and nationally. Um, and one of our expertise also does include stakeholder engagement and building staff um, and community capacity to continue the work and, and make sure that it really does move forward. Um, we, uh, we include a lens of environmental justice and equity, which we feel is um, crucial to this work um, at all junctures. Um, so we're, uh, again, grateful to just be a part of the city's work in this space. Um, 
uh, one of our partner firms is AMBG, and we have Abby Bohannon on the call here tonight to support um, to support and provide uh, her you know her input on on this process. Um, but Abby really brings expertise in community outreach and engagement, specifically with underserved populations. Um, she brings a lot of experience in capacity building, both uh, for committees as well as for the community at large. Um, and has a background in community health and health needs assessments and planning. Um, so a lot of really, really important aspects to making sure that we are um, integrating equity into evaluation and program design um, through both our process with the community as well as the outcomes that we hope to come out of this work. And then on the um, more technical side, we have Pinion Environmental um, supporting the work on air quality and water quality. So we have Dustin Collins from the air quality team here this evening to answer questions, um, as well as Carolyn Bayous from the uh, water quality team. And um, Pinion is really providing a wealth of expertise in terms of air quality um, and water quality assessment, monitoring, data analysis, uh, resource planning, um, everything from green infrastructure and stormwater management to identifying point and non-point source pollution. So we'll go into that in a little bit more detail, but just wanted to give you an overview of the team. As Dominic mentioned, we have uh, three phases for this project. The first one of phase one just wrapped up in the end of August, excuse me, we're in October now. Um, the end of August, we wrapped up phase one. We did have some delays uh, specifically in regard to the development of community-wide strategies and uh, really getting the Environmental Policy Advisory Committee going. Um, so some of the work from phase one will continue to move into phase two and phase three. Um, however, really in phase one, and, and what I'll share with you this evening, um, is our analysis of greenhouse gas assessments um, was completed, as well as the business as usual forecast. Um, we worked with the city and some of your staff to develop um, some recommendations around organizational sustainability, and we'll be finalizing that in phase two. Um, we started to engage the EPAC and the city's community of stakeholders around some community-wide strategies, but really that will get going in, in this phase of phase two and, and into phase three. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, and then on the water quality side um, and the air quality side, monitoring plans were, were developed and um, a lot of data was analyzed to make sure that we understand really what is happening and where the city wants to take this information, what can be useful in the future. Moving into phase two and phase three, we'll, um, oops, sorry about that. Moving into phase two and phase three, we'll continue to um, obviously, as I mentioned, gather feedback from the community, modeling greenhouse gas emissions reduction strategies, um, and continue to develop some policy and guidance documents. Now you can move on. Thank you. So starting with the total uh, greenhouse gas emissions inventory, um, I do wanna note that what Dominic published uh, today on the city will probably reflect a, a slightly different number. We um, corrected some data that was, that was in the final emissions inventory um, based on some comparisons with, uh, with EPA data that, that we'd received. Um, but the, the main takeaway here is that the city has uh, produced about 2.1 million metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions in 2019. We use 2019 as a baseline for the city rather than 2020. Um, although 2020 is obviously a more recent year, we wanted to use uh, data that was from a year that we felt was a little bit more representative of what happens in a normal year. Um, and as we all know, 2020 was not very normal. <clears throat> and then the other primary thing to draw your attention to is the large orange section on this graph, uh, this pie chart, which shows that over half of industrial, or excuse me, over half of the city's emissions are from industrial sources. Um, and the majority of these are coming from Suncor's operations. Um, so about 86% of the city's um, uh, industrial source emissions and 46% of the city's total emissions are from Suncor alone. Um, if you can switch to the next slide, Dominic. And before we jump to the next slide, I do wanna mention that um, at the beginning of the presentation that we did say that the um, the greenhouse gas inventory is posted and up on the city's website. If you go on the city's website, that does reflect the new numbers. And just for reference in this conversation, the total emissions um, decreases to 1.9 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. Yes. And then the emission sources increases to 57%. So that it's not a huge difference, but there are some minor um, differentiations that we got from um, the consultant after they, they finalized the document, which occurred after the publishing of the presentation. So just some minor differences. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. Um, so this uh, visual really shows a little bit more detail of, of 
paints, it paints a picture of where the city can, can really have a natural um, of, uh, of emission sources. Um, so total, we actually looked at, uh, it was that, that final number of basic emissions is 842,000 metric tons, not 971. Um, that reduction is primarily uh, in regard to the solid waste sector where, where we found some um, corrections in, in the data that we'd received. Um, but one of the big things to note is, is again, because we're looking at sector sources here, um, we can understand a little bit more where the city has the opportunity to influence emissions over the, over the future years. Um, so for example, looking at 30% uh, of emissions coming from commercial buildings and 18% of residential from residential buildings, and then 30% from electricity and 20% from natural gas, we can really start to see uh, where there is an opportunity to reduce emissions over coming years um, through strategies that can promote the use of renewable energy within the community, um, improved building codes that reduce energy use and, and save the community members um, a significant amount of money and reduce energy burden in the future as well. 28% um, of emissions came from vehicular travel, uh, and um, that's a, a little bit higher than what we might normally expect um, in, a, in a community of this size, but uh, there's a lot of um, transportation activity happening. Um, and I apologize, actually, the, the corrected number for transportation sector is now 14% with our new, I've got our new emissions inventory open here. Um, Council Member Hurst, I see that you have a question. We, I, I wanted to, if it's Okay with you. I wanted to breeze through the presentation and then and then make sure we have time for questions afterwards. Um, is that all right? Great. I appreciate that. Uh, Dominic, go ahead and switch to the next slide here. Um, so one thing that we wanted to note was just comparison to other surrounding communities here. Um, so again, this shows our, uh, our total emissions, not including those industrial sources. Um, but as you can see, the emissions per capita um, and per household are higher as well as per employee. Um, and want to note that's, poor, that's per person employed within the community, not per city employee. Um, but those numbers uh, do rank a little bit higher than what we see on average. Um, and it's really impossible to make an apples to apples comparison across communities as, as I'm sure many of you uh, would understand and are aware. Um, and Commerce City is very unique in terms of the, um, the economic makeup and the, the, just the business community that exists within, within Commerce City. Um, and some of the activities, so things like Tower Road Landfill are, um, all of the emissions that, that happen within Tower Road Landfill are attributable to Commerce City um, because it is within the city limits. Same with the uh, wastewater treatment facility. Um, so it's likely because of the makeup of the city's um, economy and the business sector locally, Commerce City will probably always track a little bit higher than, um, than average in terms of emissions per capita, but there is still plenty of opportunity to, um, to address opportunities for mitigation measures and reduce emissions over the coming years um, through policy program and uh, land use planning. This is a draft business as usual forecast, um, along with the emissions inventory that was updated and uploaded to the city's website. Uh, we do have a newer version of this business as usual, business as usual forecast as well um, that, uh, that reflects some more recent data. And it is now showing um, this, this graph that you're looking at here shows a 15% increase in emissions between now and 2050. Um, what we're looking at now is actually a 5% decrease. Um, in large part, that comes from some updated data that we had regarding um, waste emissions and specifically the closure, the anticipated closure of Tower Road Landfill, um, which reduces emissions uh, that are attributable to the city significantly over the coming years. Um, otherwise, the, the primary drivers in emissions reductions are coming from um, the use of more renewable energy by the utilities that are providing electricity to the city, so Excel Energy and United Power. Um, and all of the other emissions were anticipated to grow uh, in track with DOLA's population estimates with the, uh, for the city over the coming years, as well as um, some state level projections and goals. Um, we did not incorporate the state's greenhouse gas roadmap goals into uh, the business as usual forecast. We assume that the state will not be able to meet its goals without any sort of local action um, on the part of communities like Commerce City. So, um, so really we anticipate a very small reduction in emissions between now and 2050 for the city, um, but not anywhere near what, uh, what is um, stated as, as necessary by many 
um, leaders in climate science anymore. Moving on to our organizational sustainability task, we um, have done quite a bit of work to develop some strategies and recommendations around policies, um, programs, uh, initiatives that the city can implement to improve operational or organizational sustainability. So this is looking at uh, really what's in with, within the city's own wheelhouse within your operation. So energy use in city facilities, um, the use of city fleet vehicles, um, waste activities, and then waste uh, reduction within city operations. Those are all things that fall under this banner of organizational sustainability. Um, our team conducted a series of informational interviews, as well as a staff survey, um, and held a staff focus group a couple of weeks ago. Um, and the main things that came out of that was uh, a list definitely of some, some really high level opportunities and some high priority opportunities that can be um, implemented in order to improve sustainability in city operations, um, as well as um, some idea of sort of what if the barriers are to, uh, to some of these uh, sustainability opportunities. And those really came out as, as a lack of policy was kind of the number one thing. Um, so... Uh, just, just having stated policy around sustainability being a priority um, can really move things forward uh, and was, was seen as staff as, as something that, that would be very helpful. Um, other than that, uh, there was a feeling of a lack of support for change and a lack of funding, but I think those are things that can all um, trickle down through, through uh, better policy around sustainability. So our next steps is taking what we've learned and heard from staff and our own research um, in developing a memo on organizational sustainability policies and strategies that we'll be delivering to leadership um, and sharing with them and gathering their feedback on before finalizing. Regarding the community-wide sustainability strategies, um, the Environmental Policy Advisory Committee that this uh, council approved and put together um, is on hold right now um, until a new staff liaison is, is identified, uh, but we will continue to engage them, that group, over the coming months by providing resources and information um, to really keep them a part, feeling a part of this process and make sure that, that, um, that they stay engaged and excited to be involved in this work. Um, in addition to working with that EPAC, we'll be holding three community workshops um, through the winter, more likely than the fall, um, and we'll be also convening a technical advisory group of external stakeholders um, for two workshops. And really the, um, the process for this is that we'll be, uh, we'll be sharing all of the information that we've learned through greenhouse gas inventories, air and water quality monitoring, et cetera, um, to help and as well as some suggested sustainability strategies to help the EPAC and the community identify and prioritize work and outcomes that are most important to them. Um, we really see this as a community driven process. This is something that, that we want to make sure that the final recommendations, strategies and policies that are identified for Commerce City are those that are um, most important to the residents who are most impacted within Commerce City. Um, so it's really a community led and community driven process and we're, we're very excited to get started with the EPAC um, as, as soon as we're able. And just a little bit more on the Environmental Policy Advisory Committee, um, their specific functions really do include providing recommendations to this group of council, um, as well as to staff on what they wanna see happen within Commerce City. Um, they'll be advising on and also supporting outreach into the community. So helping to spread the word about some of the um, activities that are happening, helping to gather feedback and bring that back to um, the city and the consulting team so that we can make sure that it is uh, shaping all of the recommendations. And then um, they'll obviously also be analyzing all of the data um, and information that we provide to um, help to draft those, uh, those policies and recommendations that are made. They really are the driving force um, of the city's development of the environmental policy. Um, so again, we're, we're just very grateful to this group and we can't wait to get started with them. We did have the opportunity to have two onboarding me meetings with this um, just awesome group of representatives in September. Um, and then we'll be kicking off the first meeting of seven um, in the winter uh, to really start diving into um, some of the different issues, what problems we're trying to solve, and what solutions do we want to see Commerce City move forward with. Um, and then, as I mentioned, there will be two additional workshops with a technical advisory group, and their role is really to provide feedback on the EPAC's recommendations. So we want their input on what the EPAC has said they think is important. Um, but the EPAC will still be driving that process again. 
On the air quality side of things, the opinion team has been um, very busy. So they've recently delivered a draft community impacts report um, and we'll show on the next slide a, um, a great visual of that um, from that report. Uh, but that report includes emission sources, um, a variety of different pollutants that are within and within a, a half mile boundary of Commerce City. Um, emissions are broken down per pollutant and itemized by industry sector, um, and it provides a very graphic uh, representation of you know, where there's impacts and where those um, impacts are in relation to uh, neighborhoods and other sensitive sites, um, such as hospitals, schools, and churches. Um, the opinion team has also started on an air quality monitoring plan um, that will supplement uh, ongoing monitoring efforts and um, is working on a thresholds report, a modeling guidance document, and the oil and gas standards plan. Um, the image on the next slide shows the uh, volatile organic compounds map from, um, from that impacts report. Um, so this is just an example of some of the work that Pinion is doing. Um, in, in this uh, map, what you're seeing is the different colored dots are representing different levels of uh, VOC emissions um, from stationary sources. And then those two zoomed in areas, you can start to see a couple of the icons representing um, hospitals and churches and schools. So where those emissions are in relation to what we might consider community assets or, or even sensitive facilities. Um, so there's a variety of maps that um, show different different information, but um, the same level of detail and, uh, and really um, useful information in terms of understanding the impacts throughout the community on, on air quality. On the water quality side, um, again, the opinion team has been very busy um, developing uh, LID guidance documents. Um, so LID is low impact development, and I think we'll have a um, future conversation with this, with this group of, of council members. Um, to share a little bit more information on, um, on what that will look like uh, for, uh, for your future consideration. Um, in addition to that, uh, Pinion is also working on um, and has completed a point and non-point source solution map. Um, so as you can see, this map here illustrates non-point sources of water quality pollution. Um, so it's a heat map, so the, the darker the kind of orangey color, the more there is a uh, non-point source pollution. And non-point source just means it's, it's not coming from any specific um, facility or outlet, uh, but is, uh, is just a, a, a source of pollution is, is higher in that concentration in that area. Um, and then Pinion had a meeting with the water quality staff at Commerce City back at the end of um, September and discussed the, the next steps on all of the different water quality work. Uh, Dominic, if you go to the next slide, we can kind of dive into the details on that. Um, so we have compiled stream water quality data um, and screened it for an analysis. Um, and looking at that, we, uh, we can understand stream water quality to identify where those, again, those pollution um, sources are and problem areas are around the city. Um, and moving from there, uh, gaps are being identified to inform monitoring needs um, and Pinion is, is developing memos to inform this um, uh, and share this information with the city and, uh, and the community as we move forward with that process as well. Um, so I won't belabor the point on this, but um, as I mentioned, we'll be moving in phase two and phase three just into continued engagement. Um, and then more in phase three, moving towards recommending the final policies um, that the city can consider in terms of uh, environmental and community health, sustainability, and then air quality and water quality. And water quality monitoring will continue throughout the process. Um, so we do have one specific question for council tonight that we'd love your consideration on and, and to hear your thoughts on. And that is uh, whether the city should consider setting a greenhouse gas reduction goal. Um, other communities in the area and many other communities that we work with that, um, that do sustainability related work will set some sort of uh, greenhouse gas larger emissions reduction goal, um, usually a longer time frame, something like a 2050 goal because it really does help to communicate the city's work and establish a common why. Um, there's different ways that we can go about doing this through either bottom down, or excuse me, bottom up or top down approach. Um, and I can get into more details on that. Uh, but I know you all have many questions as well. 
Um, so this is just one that, uh, that if you have some thoughts on, I would love your input. But other than that, would would love to open it up um, to questions uh, from this from this council. Does anybody on council have any questions or comments for this presentation? Council Member Madera. So I had one question going back to the mission slides. Um, there was some emissions attributed to electricity there, but we don't have any um, emitting generation stations or anything of the sort for electricity. So is it area specific or are we just talking about energy use that's emitting somewhere? Yeah, th thank you for that question. That's a great one. Um, so, and I think it, it'll be the next one would be a better description of it, Dominic. Um, but basically, so the electricity emissions that are included here on this slide, um, numbers aren't showing up for me, but that's, it's the green, <laughs> the green yeah, edge there. might have to go one more slide. Looks like, oh, maybe not. Yeah, mine has numbers. Okay, come on, strange. Come there on we now. go. <laughs> yeah, it does. It's um, for some reason it's still missing some, but regardless. Um, so what those electricity emissions are is they're considered scope two emissions um, and scope two basically means it's um, emissions that are produced elsewhere, but are attributable to the community because of the activity in the community. So while the, the actual likely coal fired power plants or natural gas generators that are producing that electricity are sourced elsewhere, they wouldn't be, um, they wouldn't be creating that much electricity if it were not for the community using it. So that's why it's attributable to the community. And that's um, a standard reporting practice for, for greenhouse gas emissions and inventories. Okay. That's yeah, I was just asking, you know, uh, if we reduce that, it's not necessarily gonna improve you know, the air quality in Commerce City, right? Because some of these generation stations are hundreds of miles away or you know, located yes. elsewhere. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Some are a little far. There are some that are a little bit closer as well. Um, uh, but it's uh, it, it actually reducing your emissions from natural gas are um, will get you more immediate air quality impacts, certainly, and transportation as well. Councilmember Hurst. Yeah, thanks. Um, so why only 0.5 miles radius? That is a great question. Dustin, mind if I throw that one over to you? Yeah, I'm Dustin Opinion. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we wanted to basically just account for the fact the admission sources that are not necessarily within city limits, but near city limits could potentially have air quality impacts on the citizens. Uh, so we set uh, for this report we delivered, we set that half mile boundary as a, as a starting point for collecting data to, to, to show those sources like on the graphic uh, you saw that shows the city and the buffer, we wanted to make sure to show and disclose those sources that we felt could potentially still have an impact even though they're not in city limits. Um, okay, on the 28% transportation uh, from fossil fuel transportation, can you tell me what would be included in that? Yeah, absolutely. So, and it is um, with our revised uh, inventory, it's now 14%, but regardless, um, what falls in that category is basically any sort of on-road transportation. So, um, your you know, standard vehicles that people are driving to and from work, um, freight trucks, uh, railways are included in there as well. Um, and a very, very small amount comes from electric vehicles, but it's primarily fossil fuel vehicles. So the airport has no impact. Is that what we're suggesting in this report because uh, I would, I would ask that we consider that as well, because they have more travel miles over our city than any other surrounding airport, and there's plenty of air quality reports out there that call out six to eleven miles from the, from the runway have the greatest impacts, and Reunion Coffee House is six miles from the runway. 
Okay, so you would request that for the air quality impacts report a larger buffer to consider that um, those um, transportation activities. Well, by your definition, by the definition that was given of they're generated somewhere else, but have an impact to the activities in the city that is fits the definition better than most. Yeah, that's <laughs> so that's it. And that's a great point. Um, so the, the air quality impacts report and the greenhouse gas emissions impact report are, are two separate items and and actually um, the the boundaries for the emissions report in terms of um, best practices on, on reporting and what's sort of a global standard um, for transportation activities in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, you only are supposed to consider what happens within the city. Um, now, in terms of air quality impacts, I know Dustin's team did look at um, mobile sources as well. That um, map that we had was just one of the maps of um, stationary sources, but, but we do have some information on mobile sources in there as well. So to follow up on that, um, thinking about it that way, so the city and county of Denver also prepares a greenhouse gas inventory and their airport operations and the emissions associated with that are contained within their report. Um, but the air quality impacts assessment is something that could potentially look at, you know, any emissions that come from um, air travel that crosses over the city and things like that. And um, Dustin, if you have any additional thoughts on that, then we can share those too. Yeah, that's definitely something that could be uh, considered. I guess it could be important to clarify that um, the impacts report uh, is really having uh, really has a focus on uh, disclosing the emission sources in and near, and not necessarily uh, doing that following step that would like predict the actual um, monitoring uh, data or the the impacts in like a PPM or PPB sort of level that could be taking place uh, within the city. Um, so. Uh, in that regard, I know there's probably a lot of data out there for the emissions that are occurring in the airport. And I think that's publicly available, publicly available data that could be considered uh, to be rolled into or included here to be uh, discussed, um, but we just don't have it in here at the current time. Yeah, and an additional kind of add on to that is, is when the air quality impacts report was kind of put to, to play, that additional half mile buffer around the city was to really and given that air quality impacts can come from a number of different sources too, you know, wildfires in California has an impact on local air quality in Denver. But trying to get a sense of, you know, those those stationary sources that are with either within the city or directly adjacent to it, and understanding how those impacts influence upon each other on a regular basis to be able to guide the city in making future policy and and. Um, policy making around potential reductions in those areas. Um, so I, I think the, the thing like the airport is it's a little bit harder to nail down because it is sort of mobile and fluctuates on a day-to-day -day basis. But, you know, there is certainly data on that and it can be considered as part of the overall conversation on kind of how those different air quality sources interact with one another. Yeah, it's public record. I mean, I can figure out what runway they took off what kind of plane it was, be able to figure out the engine and then go look at the emission rate from that engine and figure that out on a spreadsheet in 20 minutes. It, I mean, that that's definitely something we should be looking at. It's the whole picture. Um, because honestly, I'm not going to make any recommendation ever without an economic impact report. And looking at 7th Runway being built at, at DEN, all of those things are considered. If we're going to have this discussion, we're going to have the discussion all the way. We're going to understand how much it's going to cost us what the impacts are going to be, what businesses are going to be impacted, what citizens are going to be impacted, all the above. It, it's not worth the money if we don't have a real conversation. Council Member Allen Thomas. Yes, thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the presentation. I was just curious, um, I know the uh, Environmental Policy Advisory Advisory Committee. Um, it, it has been put on hold, as you mentioned, because of staff. Um, but how long has it been on hold? Oh, that's a great question. Um, just a week, actually. Our our first meeting was supposed to be last week. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay. Oh, so they actually haven't met yet, then. Or? We've had two onboarding meetings. Um, so 
based on who was available, then then we got everyone everyone on the EPAC um, we had a chance to meet with. They haven't all met together. We had um, we've got eleven folks right now on the committee, and nine of them were on that first onboarding call, and two of them one were on another. So, um, so they've they've met through those conversations, but not in the official um, meetings that fall into those the seven of of the um, the council resolution for the EPAC. Okay, thank you. Okay. And then, um, you know, me, I, I just, um, I think, you know, I, it is a good idea um, to have the GHG reduction goal, but I do, you know, I do agree that we do need a little more information as to cost and, you know, more in information as to who it's going to affect also, but mm. I'm for it, you know, definitely to have regulations to protect the residents and environment, but I would like a little more information. So thank okay. you. Great, thank you for that. Councilmember Noble. Thank you so much for your presentation and for the reports. They are uh, very robust, uh, in fact, for the amount of time you've had. And to consider that in 2010, the comprehensive plan for Commerce City included uh, the residents' desire for uh, uh, GHG emission limitations. And we're now getting to it finally, um, 11 years and 10 months later. I think that um, you've done a really wonderful job compared to how quickly we've tackled it in the past. So um, this is really good. I know it's these are just first steps. And and you have to lay the markers. So that's incredibly important. I do have some questions about some of the things um, that were raised and, some, and just some things I wanna draw attention to again. Um, of course, over half of the emissions are from industrial sources here in Commerce City. We, um, uh, I've heard us described as an inland port um, recently, which is something I hadn't heard before. And that actually makes a lot of sense. And, the majority of these emissions are from Suncor operations. If you tie that then to the um, community, the comparison to other communities and um, emissions per employee that show a considerable number of employees uh, affected by, or working in industries affected by um, emissions, I would assume your comparison to other communities includes all of our sectors and you didn't exclude um, um, industrial from it. That's that correct? correct. Yeah, that's all right. correct. All right, so we're looking at um, residents in our community um, at a rate of 32.9, so in theory, one out of three, who are in positions that are um, affected by emissions that could be deleterious to their health. We really have an obligation um, since that's in our charter to consider the, the protections that we can offer, whatever we can do to help our residents when it comes, when it comes to that on a per household basis, 57.1, uh, so one out of two residents, one out of two households is affected as well by um, emissions in this community. Um, I'm glad that, uh, that the question was asked about electricity because I had that same question. Um, I'm also glad that we're talking about uh, the airport because we, do we are on the flight path now. After a new, new flight paths were put into place after a six or seven year um, process on the federal government level, that puts the flight path right over um, North Commerce City on a fairly consistent basis. Uh, just a couple of nights ago, I felt like I could reach up and touch the plane that was flying um, overhead. It's not the noise so much that gets me, it's just being able to see them that close. I, I also have another question about the report itself. Um, the, I'm sorry. Specifically, the uh, impact report, which is about um, air emissions. And um, it's, it's pretty scary 
the emissions and uh, what is generated in this community. But what's what I think would be helpful for lay people looking at the report, I don't know if this is even possible, is to have some way of comparing like what the figure is that is um, EPA allowable, if you will, and then where the exceedance is, which is something that we deal with uh, with CENCOR on a monthly basis. Um, is that something that's possible? Uh, that's a good question, Councilwoman. Um, the report presents uh, the emissions that are registered with CDPHE as like the maximum allowable emissions basically for permitting. Um, the exceedance that would take place itself would take place at the ambient air quality monitors in and around and, and soon to be within the city. And those levels are presented in a microgram per meter cube or a pounds per million standard. So um, you'll see in the report that we talk about the quantity of major sources or minor sources. And that's kind of the threshold that this emissions report um, is able to show the emissions that are registered with CDPHE APCD that would that would be above that major source threshold, um, but not necessarily an exceedance or a violation of the National Ambient Air Quality Standard, if that makes sense. Yes. Okay. So we have basically cumulative impact, if you will, of um, a lot of pretty powerful VOCs in Commerce City. Mm -hmm. um, the I was concerned about the tower landfill as well. The tower landfill is in Ward 4, which I represent. Um, there are some major developments going in right near the landfill. I need to understand better what it means for folks who would live across the street from that landfill. It has been um, something that we have discussed previously um, about you know, air coming off of it, let alone whatever else might be emitting emitting from the landfill. So whatever we can learn about more about that, it, can you add anything right now that would be helpful? Um, I can say that that might speak to the importance of our second task of developing a potential um, uh, monitoring plan that would fill in the gaps of, of monitoring air monitoring that's already taking place and proposed. And, uh, it, you know, a lot of that monitoring is really focused now and will be focused, understandably, in the Suncor area. Um, but um, Dominic and myself have talked a lot about making sure that, you know, that report uh, identifies the other areas that could fall through the gap. So I don't know if you might consider that one of the areas, but an area that's you know, maybe doesn't get quite all the attention, but we want to make sure that there could potentially be monitoring there that could uh, capture any problems that could be happening with the air. Yeah, I think that would be important. And also uh, the arsenal has a landfill. It's called Basin F. And Basin F is very close to 96th Street. It's uh, near Highway 2 and 96, near Potomac. So that would be an important one to check also. And in my experience, when I'm trying to use a pollution app, um, the EPA doesn't show any stations between Suncor and uh, Greeley on the east side of I-25. Am I mistaken in my reading of that map? Uh, no, I don't think you're mistaken. Uh... It's uh, EPA will only show a limited number of stations that meet their really sort of strict standards for long-term monitoring, but there we have to dig a little further, I think, to find monitors that would be more applicable to the area you're talking about that may not quite meet those standards, but um, it, there are some other monitors around the area uh, and uh, that's the type of information that we're gonna have ready soon in our draft report that shows the locations of um, existing and planned monitors coming up. Okay, that would be well, great. One thing I wanna share real quick, uh, Councilman Renovo, okay. um, to mm -hmm. that point, um, we're actually on that new page that we launched, um, the air quality page on the city website. Mm -hmm. There is a quick link to a number of different monitoring locations. 
So for any members of the public that wanted to get information on what sort of air quality monitors are currently present and may exist, I know just clicking on, clicking on purple air, um, I know within the RFP that um, Cultivando put together for their, um, their monitoring, they'll be us utilizing this, this uh, purple air um, software, but you can kind of see here that this shows the number of monitors that exist in a given area and um, currently show their, their current statuses. And there's about four different sites that we've linked to on the city's website where you can access that information too. Yeah, because when I am coming from the mountains and I'm looking at uh, coming into Commerce City in the where I live in the North Range, I can see the haze over my area. But when I'm in uh, my area, I can't see anything. And when I look up air pollution, it always tells me that it's uh, miles away and this is the best that they can do. So I am concerned that folks in the Northern Range are also affected by these emissions just because of air circulation and 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 as well as other other things that are here. I learned last week, and you have it on your list, that um, a measure that we approved, I'm mean, sorry, that we supported and was approved was um, legislation, state house legislation um, uh, 211189, the Air Toxic Act. And there were four facilities that were um, covered under this act that will have uh, special rules associated with them. One of them is Syncor, and the other one is in Commerce City as well. That's a Sinclair, a Sinclair Petroleum term, Terminal on 96. And that's really something that I hadn't even been thinking about until I saw this information last week. We have focused a lot on Suncor, but not on the fact that we actually have another terminal that has uh, caused enough pollution to draw the attention of the state of Colorado to have special rules surrounding it. And I believe this one is in uh, Ward 1. Um, as for barriers, lack of support or not a current policy, um, I sincerely support the efforts moving forward here and um, look forward to anything that we can do to protect the health and safety of our residents. And um, also whatever policies that you come forward with, I can't say that I'm an expert in policies by any stretch. And I so look forward to uh, policies that, um, and options that you might suggest that we can take a look at that will uh, help our community in the long run. And of course, put price tags on it, no problem. But at the same time, um, what is the cost that our residents are paying if we don't do anything? Thank you. Council Member Madera. So I was looking at the VLC emission map and um, kind of brought up another question for me is, I know you mentioned earlier that there's not a true apples to apples comparison, but do we have any kind of um, comparison based off of land mass and just, you know, the sheer size of Commerce City is a lot larger than in most cities. And, you know, what kind of brought it up was, you know, looking at the map, we go all the way across Thornton to North Glen, you know, north to south to, to Denver. And our, you know, area, is a lot bigger than most cities of our population. Uh, yeah, um, we, uh, you'll see in the report, we do have some comparison uh, points. Um, we have a breakdown of VOC emissions um, by county um, and some nearby counties. And then we have uh, not only VOC, but other pollutants as well. Uh, percentage um, of Commerce City within Adams County and then a percentage of Commerce City um, statewide. Um, so I don't know if that specifically um, answers your question. That's a really good question, but um, expanding that to additional comparisons is something that we could definitely uh, consider looking at. Yeah, I'd be interested just to see that because um, I think based on, uh, on population is a, is a little skewed just because the distribution of our population in Commerce City is so vast. And then um, listening to Council Member Noble, 
brought up another question, and that's the, the movement of the air pollution. We've been told a lot when we talk to CDPHC, and I'm on the rack for the state board that's you know charged with improving the ozone in the metro area. And we're told a lot of times that um, the movement of pollution or ozone is often kind of pushed westward up towards the, the foothills. Is that is that a fact or um, what can we tell about the, the movement? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, my, it, I, admittedly, it's a little outside of my area of expertise, the meteorology there. Um, but my understanding is the worst ozone days tend to occur when that movement is moving west and the air gets trapped. Um, it, it, when, you know, normally the air is moving east and um, again, sorry, this isn't in the report. I'm not an expert on this, but I, my understanding is that is correct. A normal movement is the east and you don't really have the highest days there, but it's when it gets trapped, when it's moving west, that it just kind of sits there and you have the really high impact days. You're right. And, and so I guess, does that impact, you know, the, the air monitors and, and that placement? Because that's usually what they've told us in the past is a lot of these air monitors are more west rather than east because of the, the movement of the pollution. It, that is a really excellent point. And that's something sort of thinking outside of the box of the traditional school of thought where, uh, hey, we have a bunch of emission sources sitting on this sort of Western spot. Let's put our air monitors here and we're gonna capture everything. That's the way it's always been done. You're exactly right. So as we look at our plan for potentially placing air monitors to make sure we capture any impacts, we need to be, and we will be keeping that in mind that kind of buck that sort of debunked school of thought and make sure we have monitors that are also east of, you know, concerning sources, I'm sorry, west of concerning sources as well to capture those sort of strange days where it is moving west and we get those weird meteorological conditions. It's a great point. So, you know, in addition to, to those, we would be in the community and have monitoring you know, where we traditionally haven't had monitors? I think that's exactly right, yes. Well, and one of the things that I'll sort of mention when the, the RFP and the scope for this project was put together, the thought behind an air quality monitoring plan, I think Council Member Madeira and Council Member Noble, you all are kind of talking about the same thing and, and really starting to figure out and assess the gaps. And that's kind of why I mentioned at the beginning and, and that's why we structured the scope of work this way where phase one was really sort of the data assessment and data gathering portion. And obviously within that is assessing any gaps in data we have and any areas that we need to look at, like Council Member Hurst mentioned, maybe the airport and some other things. And then ultimately figure out and assess and understand where our quality is currently in place or will be in the future. Um, there is a lot of activity around House Bill 1189, uh, monitoring from CDOT, monitoring that will be coming from Coltivando and monitoring that's been done and will continue to be done by CDPHE and figuring out, you know, a monitor is only as good as telling you what you know, they are, the potential pollutants levels are within a specific location at a given point of time. And to your point, if they're all on the west side of the slope and, you know, they're not measuring what actual impact, air quality impacts are exactly where, you know, as a city we'll be needing to make policy, then that, that's part of the considerations that I think Penny will be taking into account um, when they develop a monitoring plan for the city. Awesome. And then uh, finally, just circling back to your question, you know, I definitely think that we should set a, a reduction goal and uh, and work towards that. And, you know, I look forward to seeing what you guys come up with and what the, um, what our residents come up with in order to reduce those uh, greenhouse gases. Thank you. Member Noble. Sorry, just one other quick one that I forgot. Uh, failed to mention, which is um, the uh, oil and gas sites that are just north of our border, uh, at just north of Outlook. And um, they run in almost a straight line uh, due north. And we certainly know when the winds are coming from the north and the northeast because they flow over, over our area. Sometimes we can smell cows. So we know what's going on in that area. Um, 
it would be important. I think we talked about this before is to have some sort of monitors to pick up what might be happening in unincorporated Adams County also that could be flowing into uh, Commerce City. Thanks. Great, great point, Councilman. Noble. We'll take that into consideration for sure. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, would like to thank all of you for your time this evening. Thanks for the work so far that you've done and look forward to seeing what comes out of phase two. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Next up, we are going to skip the Derby area presentation and move into the Derby district presentation. We'd like to invite Steve Timms, planning manager, to make the presentation. Very good evening, uh, Council and uh, Honorable Mayor tonight. Um, we do have an update on uh, the Derby district. And uh, thank you, Jordan, for pulling that up. Uh, next slide, please. So just a, a agenda for the uh, tonight's presentation. We'll talk a little bit about the surroundings and background on, uh, on Derby. Um, we'll talk about some of the regulatory items that have been uh, approved through the years. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, Derby Review Board and Catalyst Funds, how those are utilized, some current projects, and then just a little uh, SWOT analysis at the end um, to kind of say, um, kind of where Derby's at and where some opportunities lie in the future. So next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So starting with our uh, surroundings and background, again, Derby is this triangle area located on the uh, northeast quadrant of uh, uh, East 72nd and Highway 2. And uh, obviously it extends, it's primarily the commercial core area, but it also does extend uh, into some of the residential area just a little bit to the east. Next slide, please. So a little history on, on uh, Derby for uh, folks that may or may not be aware. So it, it is one of the original communities of, of Commerce City. Um, it did start as an original railroad um, stop. And um, it really started to uh, develop in the 1940s and 50s with obviously the arsenal growth and with Stapleton Airport growing as well. Um, in 1962, it became part of Commerce City. Before that, we were Commerce Town. And then um, most of the buildings within Derby, not all of them, but a lot of them, um, date from the uh, mid-century, 50s and 60s and 70s, located within that core area. Next slide, please. So after the 1970s, 80s, 90s, et cetera, uh, up until really the mid-2000s, there was a lack of investment um, within the last 30 years in that particular area. And the infrastructure, you know, we talked a little bit about the infrastructure with drainage and, and things like that tonight. Um, there's also infrastructure with just with sidewalks and roads and utilities and lighting um, that still needs to be addressed. So vacancy rates remained high during this time. There wasn't much uh, in the way of retail anchors and, and there wasn't much curb appeal and there weren't really entertainment options for, um, for citizens. You know, there was a bowling alley at one time that's uh, closed down and things like that. But um, so Derby suffered some tough, tough, tough times going to the mid 2000s. Next slide, please. So on um, the district itself, about 131 properties, uh, 60 residential, 64 commercial, uh, several parks, several churches, the library, um, the high school, and the fire station. Those are also within um, the Derby boundaries itself too. Next slide, please. Okay. So now we're going to focus on some of the regulatory. So starting in the mid 2000s, city council at the time um, said, hey, we'd like to take a look at Derby and, uh, and do some efforts to help revitalize it and improve it. Next slide, please. And here you see some of the items really going from the mid 2000s up until about 2017, 2018 at the end. But we'll talk about these. They, they uh, City Council passed a master plan for the area. They uh, created updated zoning, PUD zoning. It's been actually been amended a couple of times. Um, they passed, um, and also the Urban Renewal Authority passed an Urban Renewal Plan for Derby. There are uh, design guidelines and standards in place. Um, there was a review board created, um, catalyst fund money that's reappropriated um, each year um, to help the uh, review board that's been passed. And then most recently, the lighted, lighting and signage plan has also been um, uh, authorized as well. Next slide, please. So this um, is just an excerpt from the Derby Master Plan, but it does kind of call out um, how kind of how the Derby of the future could kind of look in terms of um, of layouts and things like that. And uh, it's just a combination. It takes it block by block and, and looks at each block and says, what are some uh, strategic 
uh, first, what makes sense, et cetera. And so that's just a page for that. Next slide, please. Some of the goals of uh, the Derby Master Plan, of course, uh, reestablish Derby as a destination, uh, enhance its visibility and identity, um, revitalize it through uh, new buildings or new development with focus on design, uh, become an environmental model through ecology, economy, and culture, and then transfer Derby into a healthy and, and multimodal traffic environment. Okay, next slide, please. So within the master plan, um, it does lay out the vision for the Derby Commercial District. It does identify framework for a future uh, PUD uh, mixed use zone district, residential and commercial. It does explore items for the future design standards, although it leaves those to a specific uh, separate document. It does identify responsibilities for the uh, review body, which then became the Derby Review Board does encourage an urban renewal district to help pay for improvements. That urban renewal district has been created. And then it does identify the purchase of the Derby Resource Center. Now it's a small business development center. So the city actually has property in addition to the, the parks and the streets, but the city also owns the uh, small business development center there at 72nd and Monaco as part of um, the inventory of uh, city facilities. Next slide, please. So as it relates to the relationship to the comp plan, so on the, the comprehensive plan itself does call Derby to become a redevelopment focus area, as well as a future activity area uh, that focuses on community gathering. So um, that was just one of the uh, um, uh, attributes that the comp plan gave Derby. Next slide, please. In terms of implementation of the master plan, so um, some things that the master plan suggested the city has done, such as, again, created um, the urban renewal area for it and created the uh, Derby Review Board and also created and, and continues the funds, the catalyst funds. Um, however, there are some uh, additional strategies which have yet to be fully achieved. And those include additional CIP. So um, there's still additional work needed on the roadways, on the sidewalks and, and uh, the lighting as, as uh, you all have uh, discussed over the past couple of years, right? A strategic marketing campaign for Derby um, has really never really taken off to the full extent. And then continued partnership with the businesses. So again, um, the existing businesses, some are new, some are long lasting. Um, we'll talk about some of the ownership issues here um, at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. So after the uh, uh, master plan, then uh, it was suggested that Derby get rezoned. And, um, and Derby, the PUD for Derby was first approved in 2007. As I referenced, there were two amendments later on in 09 and 15, um, but the Derby PUD does break down um, Derby into blocks and it uh, allows different heights and different uses, different characteristics for each of those blocks. Um, it does establish uh, and modernize as each amendment brought in more modernization for approved uses. Um, it does identify non-conforming standards. It does talk about setbacks and parking. And it does approve a variety of community amenities such as use by rights. So long before the city approved food trucks and community gardens throughout the city, um, Derby PUD actually allowed those um, as a use by rights. So in some ways the Derby uh, zone district is kind of, kind of a leader in those areas. Next slide, please. These are just excerpts from the uh, Derby PUD showing how it breaks it up into lots and gives the different standards, et cetera, for um, the different areas of Derby. Next slide, please. And again, these are just from the use table. Um, you've seen these in other PUDs, but it shows again, what would be allowed as use by right or not allowed or a conditional use, et cetera. Next slide, please. So after the zoning was in place and the next action was taken was uh, to become an urban renewal area. And um, that occurred in 2009. And I know that uh, council and also your role on the urban renewal board um, have just recently learned or, or had a study session about uh, uh, blight and uh, some of the work that is done there. So this was done and approved both a blight study and a urban renewal plan. And there is a tax increment financing. TIF is in place for Derby that covers both sales and property tax um, and within Derby. All right, next slide, please. So after the uh, urban renewal authority was established and this, the city approved uh, design guidelines and standards. And um, again, those help um, some of the items there on the right, um, help with some of the, attaining uh, some of the goals found within the master plan. 
Next slide, please. The next couple of pages um, are just examples that show you some of the ideas. There's streetscapes and colors and windows and brick and, and different patterns. Next slide. Again, opportunities for signs. They went after the mid-century modern. Back then it was Googie, you know, 11 years or 12 years later, it's probably more mid-century modern is kind of the approach, but um, there's some uh, types of uh, decorative treatments there on playgrounds and outdoor dining and things like that. Next slide, please. And they're just images of, of, of buildings like this and some of the ways that you can kind of achieve some of those guidelines and, and standards. Next slide, please. And then the most recent example then was in 2018, um, the lighting and signage plan um, that was, uh, that was uh, brought about. And so, you know, just recently, uh, council was reviewing uh, one of the entryway signs right along 72nd and Highway 2 where Derby Tire used to be. That came out of this. And um, also the lighting plan. We know that um, Jenna Lowry has been working with you all about um, updating the lighting, right? Because we've heard from uh, residents and businesses that a lot of people don't feel safe um, after dark. And so um, opportunity to update that lighting um, throughout the district. Next slide, please. And these are just um, pictures from that plan, again, showing that it's more than just one type of sign, that it's meant to be a whole sign package uh, throughout the whole area. And really up and down 72nd and Highway to a wayfinding opportunity um, for the southern part of the city. Next slide, please. So in addition to those regulatory um, uh, items that have transpired, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the historical inventory as well, although the city did not play a direct role. Um, it was commissioned by the Historical Society and worked with History Colorado. They did a historic district survey um, in this area. And this was back in 2014, 2015, and they, uh, studied, they did a lot of research, and um, did determine that the majority of structures are associated with the post-World War II developments, so that mid-century, and they did find that several um, are contributing to the, what they call the modern movement style of architecture. So um, no designation was placed on Derby, but um, it, is a, it is a good report, interesting report um, that, um, that looked at that area from that perspective. Next slide, please. And then in addition, I, I would be remiss too if I didn't talk about outreach in general. So outreach is a big component of all these plans and all these facilities. Um, it has included direct uh, mailings and community meetings and nonprofits and uh, bilingual services. And it has contributed to um, multiple victories for Derby. So the Derby Diamond and Joe Riley Park renovation and the Resource Center and uh, safe routes to school right on 72nd Avenue. Um, all of those came about through uh, good community um, input and feedback. So um, that's an important topic. Next slide, please. So let's transition just for a moment, then to talk about the review board and the catalyst funds, now that we know kind of where their, their roots came from, if you will. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the Derby Review Board, their purpose is to uh, determine if applications meet the intent of the design guidelines and the, and the master plan. So they review applications, and um, the next paragraph talks about what they review. So they review exterior items, so remodels or lighting or windows or roofs, or I'm sorry, not roofs, windows or doors or signage. Um, those are all reviewed by the uh, review board. And, um, and then interior remodels, um, re-roofing, HVAC equipment, et cetera, those are not reviewed by the board. And then timelines, those could take one to three months um, they go before the Derby Review Board. Next slide. The Derby Review Board meets uh, the uh, third Tuesday of the month at, uh, at 5.30. This is our current membership. Um, we have two council members. Um, Oscar and Megan are the council representatives. And uh, just one note, um, I know council usually likes to ask, right, what can they do to help um, uh, staff and things like that. So we do have one position on the review board. We have a design professional position open. So if uh, any council knows anyone that's has uh, experience with architecture or landscape architecture or, or design or things like that, construction, um, we would love to have them on the review board. All right, next slide, please. So the responsibility of the, of the board it is in the municipal code, and this is just um, an excerpt from that. But uh, again, they overview, oversee, excuse me, the um, development applications that reflect the uh, design guidelines and the sub area plan, and they also can, um, can approve catalyst fund money. Next slide, please. 
So the Catalyst Fund program, this is funded out of each year. Um, it goes um, into the uh, urban renewal account for Derby and it's $83,000. And that money is to um, hands in uh, commercial properties located within the district through exterior uh, renovations, and signage and landscaping, et cetera. And um, you can be a leasee, you can be a property owner, um, you can be a tenant, um, you're, you're allowed to apply for that money. And then basically they'll, they'll install the improvement and then they'll get reimbursed um, upon completion or upon a permit issuance or installation or CO or something like that. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of uh, the funding, so the review board, um, they can approve up to 50% of the total cost of a project up to $25,000 per applicant per year. So, um, so that's, that's a hefty amount that can be used. And um, again, what can they do? They can do uh, signage and windows and fencing and landscaping and paint and extra renovations. Um, and uh, also the Derby Review Board has the ability if there's money left over to look at some ways, you know, the wayfinding and signage and lighting plan for strategic investments that may be more broad based that may impact the, the district as a whole and not just one property. Um, they can also approve additional uh, funds for that. Next slide, please. So here are just some examples um, uh, that the board has approved in the past couple of years. This was uh, the library um, requested. They're, they were basically doing a shared bicycle storage shed as a way to kind of a, 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 a lend and loan, if you will. They wanted to go outside of books and start also having uh, uh, bicycles as well to help people uh, get there and encourage uh, alternate uh, vehicles of transportation. And so the, Cal and so the Derby Review Board uh, did approve that project. They also approved $25,000 in catalyst funds for that. Next slide, please. Here was um, an example from 2018. Uh, Jeannie King was the applicant. She's an artist, started the Santa Fe Arts District down in Denver, moved up here, bought this facility, and, um, and really did a, a tremendous uh, remodel inside and outside, and um, did $37,498 with the catalyst funds. That was over a two-year period. So she was one that you know spent twenty five thousand. Then she came back and and asked for more. And um, that was a uh, that was an old auto garage that uh, that she really enjoyed. So that's an example there. Next slide. And then this is an example. Not all of our applicants asked for catalyst funds. You're not required to. Um, you certainly aren't. So this was an example. Metro T Mobile. They said, you know what? We're we're able to do this. We're able to do a neon sign, which is reflective of that. But we don't need any catalyst funds. And so. Um, but they did get their um, sign approved uh, per the review board, and that was a recent one there. Next slide, please. So um, the Derby Review Board has had 83 cases come before them since they uh, started, and they've spent, or not spent, they've allocated approximately $400,000 in um, catalyst funds to this program. And then um, just some brief estimates, it looks like the building permit valuations have been over $3 million. And so again, not everything is available for the catalyst funds. Interior work isn't, and roof and HVAC and stuff. But you see that there is a good cost um, benefit analysis of return on uh, investment in Derby um, with the $400,000. Next slide, please. So just a couple of current projects I just wanted to highlight um, for council. Uh, next slide. So again, the Small Business Resource Center, um, this is, um, on 72nd in Monaco, this does the one that um, our economic development department um, oversees and helps with. And um, they work with one-on-one -on -one counseling and training uh, programs for businesses and, uh, and entrepreneurs. And here's some of the different uh, uh, agencies that they partner with. And um, I know that uh, Michelle Claymore is excited uh, for them to have this location and opportunity. And she feels like it's, it is doing some uh, tremendous work for the community. Next slide, please. Now this isn't a city project, but it is critical to the future development of Derby. So um, the water lines are old in Derby. That's not necessarily a surprise. And what may be a surprise is that future improvements or future um, buildings in, in Derby without this water line replacement basically couldn't occur because they're, they're kind of constricted by the size of the water lines. So the water district is upgrading the uh, main lines in the area. And um, uh, according to their website, began in June, will continue through the end of the year. And, uh, and that will help then provide additional uh, infrastructure uh, capacity 
for additional growth um, and new businesses and new buildings, quite frankly, um, in the Derby area that we haven't had. So that's, that's exciting. Next slide, please. Entryway signage I spoke of. Um, this is the one at 72nd and Highway 2. And so just an update on council where we're at. So um, the survey of the property is complete. The sign order is complete. Um, the city is waiting on Excel Energy to confirm the electrical power locations. Obviously, that, that does have to be extended that way. And then once that's done, um, the construction should begin shortly thereafter. So um, that's exciting work that you'll see, um, hopefully, the start of this winter. Next slide, please. And then there's also an operations team. So within the city, um, there's a representative from various departments that meet periodically to discuss Derby needs and implementation. And they include, you know, building and planning and city manager's office, the police and code enforcement, uh, engineering and finance. And so together, um, we may we may talk about, hey, what are some of the uh, uh, the crime issues occurring, or what are some of the code enforcement, or what are some of the right of way issues, right? And it's a good opportunity for the city to work on collectively across departments. And, um, and help to uh, establish some kind of a, a where Derby's at and what are some opportunities in the future. Next slide, please. So as part of that, um, there's a SWOT analysis. Next slide, please. And again, SWOT analysis is um, an acronym for four focus areas, right? That help to plan or analyze a project and consider factors that may help or hinder a success. And there are opportunities then to adjust a project as needed. And so there are strength, Right, a weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And every, every project has these. And, um, and it's a good opportunity to kind of revisit and say, hey, Derby's been going on for this many years. What, what are those that make it up? And how are we gonna readjust or move forward accordingly? So um, next slide, please. And then they all fit together, of course, in this type of uh, uh, common circle and they all form the, the basis of the project and analysis, et cetera. Next slide, please. So starting with the strengths, right? So Derby has a, a great location. It's, a, it's an established location. It has a good layout. Um, the, the prices, while they have been going up, are still cheaper than elsewhere in the metro area. And that's always a plus. Um, there is a strong sense of community in, in, uh, in Derby in this part of Commerce City. That's a plus. Um, certainly some foundational uses, right? El Hardin's there, the library's there, the post office is there, the Catholic church is there. So there are some strong foundational anchors um, in this particular area. It does have a diverse demography in the area. And it also has a high quality access to regional transportation network. And so um, that's a plus that a lot of commercial districts um, don't have. Next slide, please. On the flip side though, there are always weaknesses for strengths, right? So a lot of the buildings have not been updated and they do create a poor image. Um, there is lack of clear infrastructure. So we talked a little bit about the water and the roads you know, one of the unfortunate things too is how Derby developed. If you go to a lot of um, um, kind of old downtowns, if you will, and other areas, right? There's alleys um, that are pretty, pretty block-like and, and linear. Derby doesn't have that. And a lot of those alleys that they do exist are not platted alleys. So they're kind of alleys in, in principle. And so that creates um, a weakness for the fire district in terms of fire access and fire protection and building code issues. So um, infrastructure is definitely a weakness. Um, lower discretionary spending or financial options in the area. Um, while Derby is well known in Commerce City, it's not well known in the metro area. So um, how do you make it better known and across the whole metro area to bring outsiders in or things like that? Lack of entertainment options is certainly a um, issue, not just for Derby, but uh, you know a lot of the city. Perceived lack of safety. And there are some perceived hurdles and risks for private investment. Oftentimes, you know, investment, if the capital is limited, they like to go to the place that has the easiest path um, and, the, and the lack of resistance. And so if it's perceived to be a hurdle, then that can steer uh, investment in other places. Next slide, please. There are some opportunities though, redevelopment positions. So the city, uh, city council approved a redevelopment position. Um, one of those um, uh, efforts of that position will be to help Derby and help with some uh, connect real estate deals and really focus some attention on Derby um, in a full-time capacity that we just haven't had. It is an emerging arts district. So a lot of artists that have been pushed out of Derby now are looking for other places, right? With cheaper uh, land that I talked about. And, and uh, we are seeing that there's, there's even more that could be done. Um, artists and other people just need places. So infrastructure, water grades I talked about, the desire for citizens to visit authentic different areas. We hear that over and over um, is that people want you know, authentic, different, unique places. And so that's great. 
Um, opportunities include uh, greater traffic. I know sometimes greater traffic is bad, but actually for commercial areas, it's good. And then maximization of urban renewal. So we do have an urban renewal in place. That's a good opportunity. Next slide, please. And then finally, threats, staff capacity and turnover. I, I wish I could say that, you know, the staff was consistent and, and didn't turn over. Unfortunately, that's not the case. We've, we've lost a number of people that were working on Derby. Um, that takes time to, you know, resupply and retrain and things like that. There is a lack of interest from property owners and they are absentee, a lot of them. And so for a lot of those ownerships, they may be out of state. They may be out of the area. They just want to, you know, make a quick buck. It's, it's hard for them to get reinvested within their buildings. Um, there's also a lack of funding for internal remodels and upgrades. So we have the catalyst funds for external, but the, but the internal remodels are to bring things up for code is, is not there. And there's also not been a transformative project. Usually those can sometimes recatalyze an area and that hasn't occurred either. Next slide, please. So my concluding summary um, is some takeaways from Derby. So um, these type of redevelopment districts, um, they can take decades. And I know that that's, that's not always what people wanna hear. Um, you know, Arvada, I used to work in Arvada 20 years ago and they were just starting out with their old town. They have a very successful old town today, but that's probably taking, you know, 30 years to get where it is today. Um, but incremental change has been happening. Um, the Derby Review Board and Catalyst Funds have been a success um, in there. And, um, but additional expenditures may be needed and probably will be needed for additional infrastructure and sidewalks and lighting, and potentially for internal building code upgrades as well to help some of those property owners. Um, and there's also this a cautious optimism for the redevelopment specialists to assist with real estate deals that we just haven't had before and a focus and time and commitment on, on Derby. So those are some takeaways that uh, staff has developed uh, for council. And with that, uh, next slide, I believe then that concludes my presentation and uh, be glad to have any discussion as needed. Thank you. A lot of information in that presentation. Council Member Allen Thomas. Yes, thank you for tonight's presentation. Um, thank you, Mayor. Just a few questions. Um, First one, um, do any of the current four board members live in the Derby area? So I believe I believe that Esther does live well uh, in the area or close proximity. Mm -hmm. I do not, I know that Mr. Ertl is a, he is a design professional. He's a retired architect from the University of Nebraska, a professor there. So that's his criteria. Um, and then I know that, um, uh, Anita uh, was involved with the school district and with the Small Business Resource Center, and that was her connection for a number of years. Yes, there's a new gentleman that's starting, and I'm doing orientation with him next week. I do not know his uh, background or relationship yet with the district. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Thanks. He lives by me. Oh. <laughs> okay, because it, it'd just be nice. I'm curious. Um, I know you said there's a lack of interest, but could the some of the board members possibly be some of the business owners? Have you reached out to any of the business owners to see if they're interested in serving on the board? And then also, how are you reaching out to the community and the residents that live in that area to be board members as well? So yes, so we have had some board members in the past. We had one of the um, owners of Younger Brothers Lumber Right, they were on the board for a number of years, and um, we've also reached out to the owner of the Yellow Rose Event Center, um, and also one of the uh, management, I guess, um, of the Anything Library. And so the city has uh, reached out. Obviously, for whatever reason, there's no one at this moment on it. But um, but yeah, we would certainly welcome ownerships um, or people with uh, you know workers or something like that in the area as well. Okay. So how have you reached out? I mean, because Derby's not that that big. So how are we reaching out? Because it seems even possible. Can we even go door to door to like some of those businesses? I'm just curious, how are you reaching out? So I think we've done a combination through the years. I think we've done direct mailings to tenants and owners because there's obviously difference. I know that in the past we have done door to door interest to get um uh, to get uh, at least to let people know of what's going on, what's the board is, what are offers available. And so um, uh, I know when we had Jared Draper, I don't know if anyone remembers Jared. Um, he was one of our uh, planners. He was bilingual. He was great. But I know that he frequently went uh, door to door and met the different uh, property owners and tenants and just talked with him about the program and about the catalyst fund. So um, we do try to utilize a variety of mechanisms, but um, um, 
but was that recently, like within the last two years? It has not, it's been, that was before COVID. Mm -hmm. So with the, so it, so then within the last three years then. So there is opportunity, absolutely, to, to, because again, a lot of those businesses have, not a lot of them, but some of them changed and things like that. And so there's always a good refresher uh, needed for, uh, to alert the businesses, always, absolutely. That's, that's an ongoing work in progress. Okay, all right. Yeah, because I spoke to a few business owners, um, like the check cashing one across from Save a Lot, and, you know, they informed me, you know, they haven't had a lot of city communication, so it would be nice, you know, they said maybe three, even four years since they've heard anything, and then I was also curious when you mentioned the commercial catalyst program, um, how were the businesses notified about that program and how long ago? Again, that's, a, that's an ongoing, I guess, update or, or um, communication that we do. Also, when they, when they come to us and say, hey, I would like to do a sign or I would like to do something, then we talk to them about the program as well. Some of them are not uh, familiar with it. And we're, in fact, we're having an application next week for Tasty Donuts. Um, right is, is going to be updating a couple of things on their building and so a lot of it is is uh, type of word to mouth to just understanding what's going on in the area so yes a lot of it is that and and it's just an ongoing ongoing cycle that has to be done mm -hmm. all right and then especially in that area um, a lot of business owners and their residents are um, concerned about there's a big homeless population in that area so what i didn't see that covered anywhere in the presentation so how are you how is the city addressing that i know we have the homeless navigator but for that derby area how are we addressing that problem in the area you know that specific talk is, has been ongoing for a number of years there was a red little house right i think that that uh that was that um some folks had some concerns about for a number of years i know that our this is before the homeless navigator but the police department would do what they could and talk to the different businesses. And when we had a neighborhood liaison uh, person on that to help them and encourage them not to give out, you know, leftover food and things like that from their, from their, you know, back, back door and things like that to encourage that. Um, but homelessness is definitely an ongoing, ongoing issue and needs to be looked at continually for that area. Okay. All right. And then I'm um, curious how many meetings, um, has the review board had so far this year? I say in general, there's probably about five or six a year um, for the review board. So we probably had, um, I want to say, and don't quote me, but I want to say maybe three or four. Okay, okay. Because aren't they, I mean, I was just looking earlier on the website on the agenda, but aren't they supposed to meet once a month, monthly? To meet once a month, but if there's no cases and no activities, then there won't be a meeting. Just the same thing as the board of adjustment. Oh, okay. All righty. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Council Member Madera. So what do you think are the, the biggest challenges to, um, you know, modernization in the, this area? I, I don't know if there's just one, you know, one challenge. I, I would probably just refer back to some of the some of the weaknesses or some of the threats right that have been identified um i i think you know i think that infrastructure is one of them because if there's not if, if there's not capacity right it's hard to it's hard to turn a, a old business into a restaurant right if the water capacity or storm or or sanitary sewer is not there i think that's one of them i think um i think it's just gonna i think it's just gonna take time i think it's just um that's why I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic again for this redevelopment position to spend some dedicated time in Derby. You know, everything we've done at this point has been a part time of a part time type of, of work in terms of the number of hours and um, to have a little bit more resources and energy focused on Derby, um, I think, well, I think, I think can only help. So I, I would say a couple of those items. And the reason I ask is, you know, I've, I'm on the Derby Review Board, and so I know there's kind of uh, the school of thought that, you know, we don't want to see conversation change. There's a lot of history here, and um, 
that type of thing. But, you know, then I go back to, if you're doing the same thing repeatedly, you're going to get the same results. And I think we're kind of stuck in the, this loop almost with, with Derby where, you know, a lot of people don't want to see it change. We, you know, especially growing up here, uh, there's a lot of history and, you know, just uh, sentimental value to, to Derby. So, but then you look at this presentation that I'm really sad that the Lester Arnold students couldn't present today because they had a great presentation that gives you a different perspective of what people are looking for to in Derby that's going to attract them there and and get some new life into Derby. So that, that's why I was asking, you know, what are those obstacles so we can identify those and try to work towards, you know, providing resources and solving those. I, I, I when, wish, yeah, I wish there was just one easy answer for that. And I don't, I don't think that there is. And if I may, Steve, just to kind of expand upon that, I think Steve hits a couple of good points with respect to the challenges. There are, there are no, there is no, I'll say, silver bullet as it, as it may be to the challenge. I, I will share with you, uh, Derby is very unique in the way that there is heritage, there is history, there is uh, cultural meaning behind Derby to the core city of Commerce City. Now in that, being able to develop within that context requires really a, a niche developer, uh, a niche uh, property owner who, who understands about being able to modernize without gentrifying an area and changing what has made it core and critical to the cultural context of, of Commerce City. Uh, and that's as much as a difficulty as being able to work through the infrastructure, being able to work through defining and bringing in new uses because you have to be able to bring in somebody who also shares that philosophical viewpoint as we do as a city and has that expectation to being able to deliver that while also being able to, I'll say, stitch within the existing urban fabric that we have. And I think to Steve's point, the senior redevelopment specialist position, you know, we'll, we'll have that expectation of being able to work within that field of who we can work with that has that bigger picture uh, is able to deliver that, not just for ultimately what the plan says, but what ultimately that's in response to the community that exists and lives and works and plays within the Derby, uh, the larger Derby area. And how much do we have in that, uh, that Derby fund currently? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, don't quote me, but I think we have well over uh, a half a million within the Derby Catalyst funds. Um, in the grand scheme of things, as we all see and know the, I'll say the increasing cost of, of development, that does not go as far as it maybe would have been able to go in support of various activities with business owners and or new development or refinement of, of, of existing spaces. But I think we can still find creative ways, creative programs that you know, allows us to be a, a part of a capital stack that creates a leverage opportunity for some of that interior work uh, and or once again, furthering and expanding on the exterior work. And that's where that position will be able to come in and really think about how we leverage urban renewal because urban renewal has a, a broad toolkit that is at its disposal that the city does not have uh, just because of various statutes. So being able to have that dedicated resource to really dive in and dig into how to redefine through some of these tools, I think will ultimately have an incremental effect that will have a comprehensive impact over the, the remaining period within the, the Derby district. And when was the last time that we changed the, or updated the criteria for use of these uh, catalyst funds? Oh, do you mean like, like expand them or change them? Yeah, the, the 25,000 uh, matching. Probably, I would say maybe 2015, so maybe six years ago. 
Okay. Because I'm just thinking, you know, we identified some weaknesses and some threats and, you know, a lot of it was uh, financial related. Um, the landowners and property owners and just having people that own property that aren't necessarily involved in Derby anymore, which makes it more difficult for, for tenants to provide some of these improvements. And not to mention, you know, a lot of times the tenants, um, they don't have the same kind of resources as the, the property owners to, to make these improvements. So just thinking, you know, what are some ways that we can really get this, you know, kickstarted? Well, what if, you know, the city invested more? We obviously have some money in the fund. We've been contributing every year and we haven't been allocating it, you know, at the same rate that we're contributing to it so you know perhaps bumping that up for the minimum instead of making it a one for one match I don't know if that's uh, tied to anything for, for grants or anything so you know, I'm kind of just spitballing here kick me under the table if you have to but you know making it so the city is investing more because you know showing that the city is committed to actually making this a reality and making this as easy as possible for people because you know i've heard the same thing for a couple of years now either people don't know about the program or they don't have the means to invest you know on their end and so it just makes it difficult because it is a great program and i just feel like you know there's obstacles that we need to identify to people being able to utilize this program. And if it takes, you know, action from us, the city council, you know, I think we, we have to, to do it to really incentivize people to, to start looking at Derby and, and start making these improvements so we can have the old Derby that we grew up with where, you know, we'd go there every weekend, shop at Hilo or, you know, we'd be hanging out at Derby bike and so, you know, I, I'd like to see something to really get that going. All good, all good points, council member. And I, I'll say, I think, you know, as we bring that position on board and as we continue to work through our existing kind of budgeting practices and, and being able to identify opportunities for resources, both internal to the organization, that being the city itself or through urban renewal, or even through grant opportunities as we're continuing to see this new administration we're seeing more and more grants that are being geared towards main streets. And, you know, we consider Derby to be our main street as an example that, right, we try to help provide a, a, a part of that capital stack to be able to go into that. So we can continue to keep evaluating uh, a, a multifaceted approach and be able to present that as those opportunities come forward to both the URA board, but also to city council as a body. Thank, Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I think uh, Oscar hit a lot of the points I was going to make about, you know, the tenants. Um, some of the building owners don't even live in the state. And we've seen that and heard that. Um, and the tenants who do live around Derby or neighboring cities um, are really tied. Um, our hands are tied. So definitely want to explore options. Or they're doing the the upgrades on their own, right? Um, so definitely want to explore the options on how tenants could really improve that. Um, so yeah, um, the other thing is, you know, uh, I think uh, Councilwoman Alan Thomas brought a lot of good points about, you know, how we get the word out and who serves on this board. And, you know, the boards and commissions, uh, this has been a struggle, just like every other board, right? Um, getting folks to volunteer their time um, that want to be on these boards and commissions. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's a whole council and city staff collaboration to get the word out even more, right? Um, and staff and uh, the city clerk's office do a great job of sending us our flyers. But with Derby being such a small area, you know, um, you know, going out to those residents, maybe holding a couple events there, I think will draw some more attention and, and getting an accurate business list and residential list from that area, I think would help because, um, 
though those need to be updated and some of the businesses are not even there or they have moved so um i think that's something that hopefully this person could really uh really work on thank you council member hurst forgot i had my hand up still so i apologize but i really think that everybody's talked about a lot of what i wanted to talk about so um Really, all I'm going to say is that I just would advocate for balance. You know, you could see um, it going one way or the other. And if we can find a balance that works for everybody, that's what I would advocate for. And then looking for incentives. You know, I, I hear everybody, you can do a minor facelift can turn into, you know, a full rebuild, if you will, because of building code, because of when these were built and how long it's been since they've been updated to building code. And so as much as you wanna participate in that facelift without like fully scraping your building, it's tough. And I'm not suggesting we cut corners on building code or safety codes or anything like that, but those incentives are important to find ways to create that balance, right? Because without, those incentives, I think we do find developers that are looking to just rebuild because you you know you you have to go all the way down to the bones um, to meet that current building code, and so you know finding a way to incentivize that that facelift that makes sense um, without that full rebuild is is kind of the balance that I'm talking about. So um, excited to see this place continue to 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 be the central focal point of the of the city as well. Council Member Grimes. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thanks, Steve, for the presentation. Very thorough and a lot of good stuff in there. Um, I was wondering, well, I too was disappointed that the Lester Arnold students weren't able to present tonight. Um, but I was wondering if, in addition to them presenting to council, if they could present to the Derby Review Board, I think that might be a nice collaboration um, to kind of bring that youthful perspective um to the review board but then i was also wondering if there's anything uh any limitation in the charter that would prevent um, a student from sitting in one of those review board positions is there an age requirement i'm gonna default you know the, the board obviously is a newer board that that is pretty new but i'm gonna default to our attorney or our city clerk on an age. I know they have to give out money and they are approving decisions. And so that may prohibit an under 18, but um, I'll shut up before I speak too much. Um, I can that's... answer that, Steve, or Mr. Sheetsley, nope. you can if you'd like to. Um, Ordinance 2043 established the Derby Review Board and in um, the composition and qualification section. Um, it lays out the membership requirements, and those are the two design professionals with experience in architecture, urban planning, or landscape architecture, and then two members of the Derby sub area, which they have to um, be a resident, business owner, or invested in real property. Um, as far as an actual age requirement, that I don't have as far as the member of the Derby sub area. Um, Mr. Sheasley might be able to provide that information, but those are the minimum qualifications in the founding ordinance. There doesn't appear to be an age requirement. It seems like um, someone under 18 may not meet those requirements anyhow, just by virtue of the requirements. Um, but I'm wondering if that's worth looking at, maybe a change to that ordinance um, just because I think, you know, maybe they're not a, maybe they're not able to vote on things related to financial matters, but the perspective of a, a student who lives in the area near the area um, might be a unique way to bring some uh, new ideas and some life to that board um, and some different perspective where we might be able to kind of re-energize some of the, the ideas and, and um, kind of what the community wants to see going forward, especially if this is going to take, you know, a decade, as you kind of mentioned, Steve, you know, it took Arvada decades to get um, Old Town together. The, the kids who are in high school now may be the ones that get to enjoy it later. So um, their perspective could be important. Uh, so I'd like to see if we could um, take a look at how to, how to do that and maybe how to find a way to get some students who would be interested, maybe specifically the Lester Arnold students who are already kind of invested in this project. So... Uh, thanks again for your presentation, though. 
And just and just a good point, and just so our, uh, council knows, we also had internal discussions because we liked their presentation so much, and was sorry that they couldn't present tonight. But we'd also like to uh, interview them for the comp plan as well. So they they have they'll have good uh, feedback on just the the uh, some other issues too. So yes, good point. That sounds great. Thanks, Steve. Councilmember Noble. Very well done, Steve. This this was all I had hoped for when I put in a formal request for this study session on this topic in May. So uh, very well done. Thank you. You covered absolutely everything. I was thinking about the incentives, and this is probably an enterprise zone as well. And so the businesses could get tax credits. Um, the businesses have to apply this month, though. They have to apply by the end of the month to Adams County Regional Economic Partnership, AC Rep. Um, and th that could actually save them uh, a lot of money. And some of these out of state owners might like to know about that, that program. Do we have a way, uh, have we tracked, we have the addresses and names of all the owners in this area? We um, this, is, this is a little bit on the ED side. I know we do have an ED representative not on the call tonight, but uh, Nancy Flock is our Derby representative. I, what I can do is uh, pass along that information you just said um, and then see if they have um, the latest directory or whatever directory they have um, of owners and properties and make sure they remind them of that opportunity. That, that would be my suggestion. Jason, anything you want to add to that? No, you were, you hit the point that I was going to bring up that, right, we work very closely through Nancy Flock in economic development with uh, the majority of the property owners in uh, Derby, either on homelessness seminars, on grant opportunities, and or on the Catalyst, uh, Catalyst Fund program. Uh, so this would be uh, an opportunity for us to engage with her to be able to bring this matter forward. Yeah, there's not too much, um, I mean, end of October. Sorry, not the end of September. Um, not a whole lot of time left, but it might be a really great opportunity for them. Um, I also hope that, um, well, first, let me just say about the artist who has moved into the area, that is so great. I have seen, I have seen her building and uh, it's really lovely. <laughs> it's, the murals on the outside of her building look great. I hope that we can uh, walk the talk since we own a building down there and put up our own Googie sign or Guji sign, um, which is the period that the 50s and 60s represent and what our new Derby sign represents as well. And um, I had the great pleasure of uh, knowing Dana Crawford and uh, she did the plan for, for Derby a long time ago, I guess, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And um, I think she'd be really pleased to see your presentation tonight, Steve. And it, it does take a while, you know, Dana did, um, uh, oh gosh, you know, lower downtown. And there was a time when it didn't look anywhere near like it does now. And I was even in college when it began the transformation. That's how long it's been. So I hope this doesn't take 50 years, but it might. Anyway, thank you so much again. You can see that everybody is very excited. So I hope the staff considers that as a, as a go sign. Thank you. Councilmember Allen Thomas. Yes, thank you, Marin. Just wanted to add a few other um, statements um, in, along the same lines, but it, it's just unfortunate, like you had mentioned, that many of those business owners do not actually own the building or the properties, and it seemed like they just want to collect the rent and not do the upgrades. So it'd be nice if the city staff you know could reach out to them and hold them accountable you know to keep their buildings and you know up, upgraded conditions just like we're reaching out to the residents you know they should be held accountable as well to maintain their properties and do the proper upgrades as well and then just wanted to add to them that joe riley park um has become a homeless place and a lot of the business owners, you know, are suffering because of the homeless population as well. So, like I said, I just wanted to mention that again, is if that can be addressed, because the businesses are really suffering. So, thanks again. Thanks, Member Grimes. Thank you, Mayor. I did have one more comment, Steve. Um, the last time I was down in that area, I noticed that the the bricked part at 72nd 
uh, in Monaco is there are some bricks that are broken, missing, um, and it's just kind of generally starting to look dingy, like a power wash could really do some good. And I don't know if that's something that, I mean, that's not quite per, per the Derby Review Board's purview, I suppose, but just a general comment um, to staff that something to look at for sure, some general upkeep there. That's in that Derby Diamond Center area, correct? That's Your right. Center. Yeah, I think we have, uh, we've identified that for some upgrades or some replacement, because you're right, it has it has not aged as well. And so I believe we're looking at either a previous CIPP or a future CIPP, but yes, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Seeing none, thank you very much, Mr. Timms. Appreciate your presentation and how thorough you were with the information. Next up, we are going to have our fourth one of the presentation of the evening, fourth and final presentation, which is the Metro District Regulation Review. I'd like to invite John Borgeli, Management Analyst, and Robert Sheasley, City Attorney, to make the presentation. There we go, sorry, I'm moving you over, took a second. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Honorable Council, here tonight to talk to you about Metro Districts and regulations. Um, Dylan, if you have the presentation pulled up. Excellent. Next slide, please. So here tonight for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, we'll just put this in context. We'll discuss Council's past actions and requests that Council has made of staff. We'll review some public input uh, that came out of those past actions and requests. And then we'll move into discussing our proposed enhanced regulations and oversight measures, as well as identifying Council's goals for the end result of these regulations, not necessarily the mechanisms of the regulation itself, but what ultimately we want to achieve from this. And then from that, giving staff consensus direction on next steps. Next slide, please. Next slide. So to put this in context, going back a few decades, Metro districts have historically been a tool that have enabled development of the North Range of Commerce City, both residential and commercial. And historically, previous councils in the city has prioritized development over strict regulation or oversight of that very overly simplified arrow at the bottom kind of showing there is a trade-off between development and regulation. And typically the more regulation we have, the less development and vice versa. We have historically fallen much more on the development side of that arrow. And we are now seeing a, a move towards the other side. Next slide, please. There, have, there are some obstacles to regulation. Uh, one of the big ones is that service plans already approved and set uh, cannot be altered unilaterally by the city. Essentially, these are signed agreements that already set out the nature of the agreement and the provisions within them. And any changes that the city would like to make now can't be imposed on an agreement that's already in place. Uh, now, the city can renegotiate service plans if they come up for an amendment, which again must be initiated by a district, or if a material modification occurs. And we'll talk a little bit more later about what constitutes material modification or if the city provides some other incentive to a district in order to bring it back to the negotiating table. Otherwise, though, the city doesn't have much in the way of recourse in order to impose new regulations on existing districts. So a lot of this action will be looking forward. Uh, and also increased oversight can increase costs to the city and implies can increase costs to residents. Essentially, if the city were to impose any fees on districts, Districts will likely incorporate that into their operations budget and then pass that on to residents through an, incre through an increase in their tax. Next slide, please. So bringing us up to speed, recent action and what this council has asked us to do. Uh, and this council has taken a lot more interest in regulating metro districts and, and staff has been working on council's direction. Uh, back in April, we had a preliminary study session to review options and council gave staff some direction as to what to do from there. 
part of that was to obtain resident feedback and stakeholder feedback. And in July and August, um, in July, we did have an additional study session uh, to provide additional feedback and continue to refine options. And then August, staff did conduct community and stakeholder outreach, the results of which were included in the packet tonight. And I'll be going over a very high level summary of that, but can also answer any more detailed questions. And there's that detailed breakdown of the results of that in the packet as well. And then tonight, uh, we're going to present some proposed changes to the model service plan, as well as the results from that community input. Next slide, please. And then moving forward, uh, would be implementation of proposed regulations and any oversight measures, the imposition of an oversight fee, potentially per council ordinance, hiring or contracting of additional staff to perform oversight, um, as is, we don't have the capacity to get as in depth as we would like to on this issue, and any additional measures as deemed necessary by council. Next slide. So getting into the community input uh, that we conducted over the summer for council's direction. Next slide, please. So staff conducted two self-paced virtual engagement sessions. Uh, there's, from what we've had feedback from other events, there's a lot of Zoom fatigue. People don't want to show up for a live Zoom event. And also it doesn't work with everyone's schedules. So instead we put together a presentation, narrated it, and put it on the city website for a couple of weeks. Uh, and also then had a link to a forum where people could provide feedback. One was geared more towards residents of Metro districts and another towards the developer community, stakeholders in the process. Next slide. So this is again, a very high level overview of, of the resident input. You do have the full survey responses in the packet in that spreadsheet. And if you have any questions or need anything clarified, I can provide that as well. We had 95 responses. Uh, so pretty good, pretty good feedback. Um, almost entirely unfavorable to Metro districts. Uh, and you can see some of the comments there and there are more specific comments uh, in the full results as well. And there is strong support for fairly robust measures to enhance oversight and regulation on districts from residents who currently do live in Metro districts. Next slide, please. And pretty much the opposite from the developer committee. We had fewer responses. Uh, those are included, they came in a variety of formats. Those were included in your packet. Uh, some responses that we had were from attorneys who represent multiple developers. Uh, so you don't have necessarily a dozen distinct, discrete responses, but they represent a slightly larger number of stakeholders uh, than the number of responses in your packet. Mostly these were unfavorable towards increased regulations as they believe that the current measures in place are sufficient to protect resident interests and that any increased regulations can slow or complicate development projects, uh, can create discrepancies and generally might cause them to look elsewhere. Next slide, please. Uh, so that kind of covers, and if, if council has any questions on action up till now, otherwise uh, I can answer that. Otherwise I'll be handing it over to Mr. Sheasley to talk about our proposed measures this evening and what we'll be doing moving forward. If you have any questions at this point. Anybody have any questions at this point? Seeing none, Mr. Sheasley. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Good evening. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? So what we have um, in your packet tonight is a draft ordinance or a new draft code section that would implement a series of um, procedures and standards, essentially, um, that will go through a, kind of at a higher level tonight. You've seen a lot of these before as we've looked at um, Fort Collins and a few others in um, late July. And then in some of the Metro district applications you've seen in the last couple of months, you've seen a lot of the, the concepts of regulation implemented in those service plans. But behind all of this, and it's important because this is a long ongoing process. And now that you've seen some feedback from current residents of Metro districts and future developers of land, but not future residents of Metro districts, um, what is council's goal? in doing this regulation? It's a question we've asked um, tangentially, but what is the problem you're trying to solve here? Because we're proposing a substantial new regulatory scheme, which as John mentioned, um, does have a significant time for both council staff um, and then uh, for the people developing land and the future residents. We wanna make sure that's consistent with council's goals for the future development of the city. And so at the end of this, uh, we have some plans for how to 
put these regulations out for additional more detailed comment um, to see if it would actually address what the community wants and if stakeholders uh, would have feedback on it. But as you listen to this, uh, see if it's if it's hitting what you want to do and if there's anything else you wish to explore additionally. Um, and so next slide, please. What we'd be doing here is um, what's not included in your packet is a new model service plan. The regulations authorize uh, the direct the city manager to create a model service plan that council would then approve formally, and then it could update in the future. The regulations have some minimum standards for the model service plan uh, that council ultimately could um, could waive in there um, in a specific application. I mean. And so, as we've seen recently, we focused on transparency and oversight and some limitation of the authority of districts um, to achieve what we understood to be council's goals going on, although there hasn't been a formal restatement of those goals. And so, next slide, please. The regulations are very long. Um, I've tried to break it down here so you can understand generally the, the concepts behind it. Um, it begins with a broad policy statement and then a somewhat odd list of preferences. The city council prefers metro districts that do A, B, and C, but does not prefer metro districts that do X, Y, and Z. Um, those are intended um, as a guide for both staff in reviewing applications for future councils and for applicants to see how their application is going to be received. It's important um, to remember that a metro district application is a, um, somewhat of a legislative act, it's a policy act as to whether the council wants to allow another government entity to form within its boundaries to finance improvements, some of which will be owned by this uh, city in the future and to provide services. And so throughout this regulation is an avoidance of strict standards that would limit council's approval. So that is um, meant behind that, um, that policy statement. There's a broad section on definitions that are um, pretty critical uh, because they include some substantive comments. We've talked about fees before. There's a specific authorization in here for an oversight fee uh, that would be paid annually, probably only by future districts. And then for, for other applications, fee structures that are within um, that that uh, limited context. We get a lot of uh, random requests for things that end up taking staff time uh, that is not compensated for by the applicant. Um, there's a sanction concept that we have included that was in recent service plan changes. And then um, we talk about the service plan requirements and then review procedures. And then finally, some of those governance and transparency standards that you've seen over the past few months. And so uh, the way this is proposed currently would have some application to existing districts. Uh, the ability to enforce some of the, these terms against existing districts uh, without changing their service plan might be called into question though. So um, keep that in mind as far as expectations when we're moving forward with this. Uh, next slide, please. And so um, some of these concepts and policies and preferences, um, you'll see, the disfavor. These things I think are things that council generally would agree with based off comments from the last couple of years. Um, a district that's just for basic infrastructure is not preferred. Uh, if they restrict end users uh, from controlling the district, um, if there are fees imposed that may be ongoing unless it's for a service, but not charging future fees uh, for capital improvements that um, have already been built. Um, they should rely on the debt and the tax that they've authorized and proposed in their service plan to do that. Council's taken issue with the repayment term and suggested a 30 year term. Uh, I propose uh, that they be a 35 year term at most, uh, 50 mil cap, and then not being in favor of smaller districts, like with a less than $5 million in future assessed value. And then um, anything that involves a developer reimbursement or unfair or unreasonable terms is gonna have a hard time getting approved by the city council. And then I've included the concept of a regional mill levy that we'll talk about. Um, this is significant and it's new and it's, it's worth exploring as you go forward. Next slide, please. 
Um, briefly on fees and process, um, it sets up as did Fort Collins. I thought it was a very good model and council seemed to like it, beginning with a concept review at the staff and then council level, and then a much more formal review. And the benefit here is that um, council has an expectation and staff has an understanding of the kind of material and information that is gonna be expected when this comes forward uh, for a more detailed review. We also um, try to prevent the rush to get uh, items approved in late August or early September. Um, and so requiring applicants to submit a lot earlier and not have expectations of a hasty review. Um, and then in here, there's a laundry list of criteria where council might deny a service applicant plan application. And those are intended as examples uh, that council could view um, as uh, the basis for taking issue with uh, an, un sorry, an unlimited list. Uh, it's not exhaustive for taking issue with a service plan application. And then, um, as I mentioned, we've established a process finally for other applications. So a staff member, city manager, city attorney doesn't get a random request um, asking for council action and then on not having a process for reviewing that. Next slide, please. One of the big concepts in uh, Metro district world is a material modification. Uh, when a district steps outside of its service plan and potentially could face legal consequence um, is when it takes an act that it wasn't um, authorized to do and, and really is material, not just any change. The Special District Act is very vague on this. It has a couple concrete examples one way or the other, but we've outlined a definition here that um, has a much broader definition um, that would allow future councils to take action against and also make districts more aware of things that are not okay. Um, some of the things about changing their debt issuance schedule, creating more risk or burden to taxpayers, um, a new one, converting taxable property to tax exempt property or excluding property without demonstrating that there's no material impact. Um, and then at the bottom, it's, it's kind of a legal technical thing, but it's in your service plans currently going right now um, under the special district act, there's a method for um, districts, if they're not sure, essentially, short summary here, if they're not sure if something is a material modification or not, they might provide a notice of taking that action. And the lack of a response uh, within that 45 days, in some cases, a lack of seeking an injunction um, on that in that 45 days could essentially stop the city from enforcing it in the future. It's the, I think, the concept that Metro District Attorneys focus on. Um, and so we would require that the, the mere lack of a response there um, doesn't mean the city's consenting and requiring an actual affirmative response. Um, next slide, please. Um, some of the key things that will be in the, um, that are in the list of proposed mandatory minimum service plan items. Um, they are attempted to address the view that Metro districts are uncontrolled, that they can just charge fees for whatever. Um, there, there's no oversight. Things that um, you could assume would be complaints and issues that future residents would take. Um, Excuse me one second, I'm losing my power. Can you still hear me, Mayor, are you? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and so uh, we would limit fees. Um, we would want to restrict any sort of IGA or reimbursement agreement that could, would increase the budget in the future without um, having council review or approval, either before the service plan is approved or after. Uh, it would restrict districts from becoming larger, providing service outside their territory or entering into IGAs um, essentially for that type of service that the district, that the city council has not reviewed in the service plan. So districts aren't taking on roles that weren't intended at the time they were proposed or at least understood by the council. Um, one concept um, from Fort Collins that's incorporated is a limit on developer reimbursement to 80% of the actual cost of improvements. Um, and if, should they be providing the funds for that? And then $25,000 for organization and not being reimbursed for the um, bonds or security uh, costs. So some significant restrictions there that would require uh, landowners or developers to bear more of the direct cost without being able to pass that along through the district. There might be another way, but not through the district. Next slide, please. 
there's a proposal to limit the debt to the lesser of the actual projected debt capacity. And there is a more detailed method of uh, determining the financial plan that would show the debt capacity and or, or the lesser of that or the estimated cost of improvements to make sure that the uh, there is a much more discrete cap on debt. As I mentioned before, a 50 mil cap that would include both debt and operations, while there essentially is a sublimit on 10 mils there. Um, as before in our current service plan, and, and I think it's good to continue into the future, would be allowing for that debt service uh, mill levy cap to become unlimited in certain circumstances. And that depends on the valuation of the property um, and the control of the board. Uh, one significant change here um, that is included, and uh, it's, it'll be important for council to discuss and get feedback from stakeholders on, is not allowing the mill levy to adjust based on the assessment rate for various property. So that when the service plan says X for mills, it is gonna remain that unless the service plan gets amended. Um, and then as far as uh, the repayment term, it would be 35 years as a maximum uh, for residential districts, unless a resident, just resident controlled board votes to allow a refund essentially. Um, I know that's been an issue that has come up with some discussion and it's worth getting feedback from um, developers and uh, underwriters to determine if that is something that is feasible, that, that could actually be borne by the market and supported. Next slide, please. Um, there are, there's somewhat vague language in this draft to allow for, to require that service plans have some independent controls for various expenditures to ensure fairness. Um, that is essentially kind of third party or monitoring or disclosures. And then a limit on debt issuance, meaning although they may have authorized their debt, they won't actually be able to go up to the bond market until they have authorized the regional improvement mill levy. That means have a Tabor election for of the initial um, electors and then um, have a development agreement the, by the developer that by which the developer would agree to provide all of the disclosures to uh, prospective home buyers. Now, granted, those disclosures are currently required by state law. Uh, so this is something of a backstop for the city to do at this point. Next slide, please. Um, within the service plan, I uh, recommended that the service plan describe the relationship between the organizer of the district and the developer so that council can understand the relationship there and then have very discrete identification of fees that will be charged, services that will be provided, public improvements, um, intergovernmental agreements and reimbursement agreements so that all of that context can be assessed in advance. So the city council wouldn't be set allowing a district to form with a broad uh, allowance of powers, um, not quite understanding what the district is gonna look like in the future. Next slide, please. And so on the regional mill levy concept that we discussed in July, um, I, this is one where I strongly encourage you to have feedback and consider strongly doing this. We, it has not entered into city financial plans, um, but the concept here is that the district would impose an additional five mills for up 25 years on property within the district um, that wouldn't be included in their cap, in their 50 mill levy cap. And the purpose of that mill levy is to provide it to the city for the city to then spend on regional improvements that would have a benefit to the people in that district and other districts. Um, it would also not have any other funding source. It would have to be something the city would identify up front. I don't know that the city is prepared to do this in upcoming service plans though. Um, the requirement would be that the initial organizers is what they do after they organize as a district is they go out, they elect their board and they have a Tabor election of the initial property owners um, for their debt authorization, for their own debt and for their own mill levy to be able to repay that debt when, uh, when issued. And that is essentially unlimited. So one of the complaints about districts is that the future owners have no ability to consent to that because it's done long before they purchase a home and um, their acquiescence to it is in the purchase of a home in, in the district. Um, what this does is it requires this that voter approval to happen at the same time for this. It won't actually be imposed though until the city uh, requests it uh, to be imposed. And then as it's collected, it gets remitted to the city. 
And so this is important for a number of reasons, not only the complexity of it, but because of the added burden um, on the taxpayers in the district. Next slide, please. And then um, these are just uh, kind of a litany of various other limits on authority that you've seen in the, in the model service plan before. Um, next slide, please. And so I wouldn't, didn't wanna run through all of the details. Um, next slide, please. Um, this blank slide is just an opportunity for me to say, I didn't wanna run through all of the details of the regulations, um, but I'm happy to address any of the components if council's had a chance to review those. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions on that, but I believe that the last slide is for, um, last couple slides are to kind of round up and ask that question again. Um, what, are, what are the goals? Of council, can we go to the next one, please, Jordan? Um, yeah, what are the council's goals? Um, is this is what we've discussed here tonight consistent with what you want to do? Um, and what else do you want to do? The next steps are to um, work on a model service plan with these proposed regulations um, based on some of your feedback tonight, and then put both of those items out for a public comment period, um, and then bring them back, bring all of that back to council, much as we did with the oil and gas regulations to discuss that feedback before finalizing those documents. And so John and I are available to answer any more questions. Thank you, Mr. Sheasley, Mr. Borgeli. Does anybody on council have any questions or comments regarding this item? Um, Councilmember Noble. There are um, some aspects, uh, th thank you very much for this. Uh, there's some aspects of this that uh, I would have liked to have had picked up also, such as the approval of a district service plan is in the sole discretion of the city council, which may reject, approve, or conditionally approve service plans. Instead, ours says uh, something quite different in that, the city is receptive to district formation and continued existence as an in instrument. I think that what we're saying, at least I am, is that there have been abuses and the abuses have been allowed to exist because of the way that service plans have been broadly written. And that is the perception of residents who live in metro districts in um, North Commerce City. I was looking through the many, many pages of comments from residents and it's every metro district, every metro district uh, of those 95 people. And I can imagine that if I knew their names, I might know some of them, but I could probably find a whole bunch more people who feel similarly about it. Also, when I think about uh, an extraordinary uh, public benefit, it would be uh, things that might lead to, for example, environmental sustainability outcomes, uh, critical public infrastructure that they would play a role in, um, smart growth management, strategic priorities that may, we might have, like affordable housing, workforce housing, infill redevelopment, economic health outcomes, that kind of thing. Um, we have a major um, uh, metro district um, that I don't know if there was any uh, attainable housing built into it, affordable housing built into it um, in terms of the service plan. When you say similar to oil and gas, what would be really wonderful is if we did it the same way that we did oil and gas which was to go through the regulations, um, either topic by topic or um, um, page by page, whatever the case might be, and then make a decision on what it is that, that we want um, to have these 18 pages presented in sort of generalities uh, doesn't help um, give comfort to residents who have been wanting um, metro districts reined in. Now, I realize that there is no 
unringing the bell, if you will, for the ones that already exist. But we can certainly do more to um, um, over use our oversight powers, which were built into some of these over um, service plans and that haven't been employed by the city. Um, and I would just like us to do this in a very deliberate fashion. Um, it's not ready for a vote as, as a single document that would then, or something that would be sent out for, um, uh, for review. I know that a lot of the developers or their representatives ask for consistency. And I would say that that's what the residents are asking for too. They want consistency. And I do have one question. Is there any property um, north of 88th that does not have, that's within Commerce City's boundaries, that does not have a service plan already approved? Yes, there are plenty of properties. Do you mean a developed property or an any undeveloped, undeveloped property? It has any property that someone has all, already had an approved service plan for. I mean, obviously there are some properties that are undeveloped that have service plans attached to them and have been approved. I'm sorry, I just still don't follow. Are there any properties that have homes on them right now or properties, no, any property no. at all? Yes. Yes, absolutely. The, um, for example, the Can-Am property that you, well, it's not in the city, so that one doesn't count. Um, Sorry, the two I'm thinking of right now off the top of my head are not actually annexed to the city yet, but are undergoing an annexation process. I do believe that there are at least some vacant properties that have um, no metro districts on them. I think there may be some developments that in the Northern Range that were not enabled or covered by metro district, but I, I know that only anecdotally. I'd be happy to follow up on that. Yeah, Jason, do you know if there are any properties north of 88th that have not yet had a service plan um, approved by a city council. I'd have to do a little bit of research, ma'am. Um, I would say as it currently stands, I think it's to Robert's standpoint, the ones that we are seeing with the development of a new metro district are those that have not been incorporated within the city's boundaries as of yet. So those that are seeking annexation uh, would be moving forward with the Metro District, but we can do some research and, and look into that establishment. Okay, so that is my concern also, is that in fact, there's nothing left. We are totally service planned out, except for um, the properties that have not yet been annexed. And, in our growth area and property in our growth area. But otherwise, everything has a service plan. So in many ways, it comes down to what is the city going to do to ensure that um, these service plans are adhered to and that we are doing all we can in terms of oversight as well. Thank you. Council Member Hurst. Yeah, I definitely agree with uh, a lot of the regulatory stuff in, in this um, in this path that we're taking. I I, I do want to caution though that I, I took time reading lots of those comments and can't disagree that I was very much in a similar place at a time. Um, matter of fact, how I got into all this, at least half and I'm probably being generous, are just educational opportunities for the city. At least half the complaints about, and, and part of that stems from the argument of, are we really gonna have the South pay for the development of the North? Because there, there are city responsibilities built into every metropolitan district that we would have had to pay for as a city, whether it was the richest developer in the world or the poorest. It doesn't matter. We're going to have to pay for city utility. And 
that is worked in the metropolitan districts that we would have to pay for out of the city budget if we did not use them moving forward. And so I think half of what we need to do is work on education of why they exist, how they exist, and you can find that information on your budget down to the detail by law every year. You can find just like the public meetings that we hold, you can find that same information about every metro district. Are some of them on crappy days during crappy times? No doubt. I'm not, I'm not gonna sit here and argue that. Can't, but you know, once once that metro district's controlled, they have the ability to change when the time and date of those meetings are. And, and again, I think education leads to more control by the residents of a metro district. There are certain situations. Um, uh, certain ways that metro district conglomerates are built out, if you will, that do take away the power of the individual metro district's voting power. We have to look at that because without the right to, to vote on the budget and its operational budget, on a, there really is no power in that taxing entity. There are a lot of things that we can do to make improvements, but I think half of our, our task here is to educate why they're there how they've been utilized and why they've made sense for the growth of Commerce City as we have two very separate ages of our city. You have a whole new growth area that is unfair to support off the tax burden you know, of the residents of the South. Now, does some of that also come from businesses? Absolutely. But by all means, we would be paying for quite a bit of, of what is necessary to build development whether it's commercial or residential, out of the city's budget if we did not use metro districts. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, look forward to this process moving forward. Thank you very much, Mr. Sheasley and Mr. Borgeli. And now we will move on to reports. Uh, Mr. Tinkelberg. Thank you, Mayor. Wanted to uh, give you a quick update. Uh, this past Thursday, Jason and I met with uh, builders, developers. Um, that's a, a regular meeting, if I recall correctly, Jason. It's uh, on a quarterly basis. Anyway, we talked about uh, pending changes, proposed changes to the impact fees, and then uh, Got an earful from them about the subdivision cases. So I imagine uh, they will be attending next Monday. Um, police crime statistics again on the website. Uh, also wanted to give you a heads up that uh, beginning Thursday, but possibly sooner, uh, Jason will be out of, the, out of the office until November 1 on paternity leave. So that's why the timing is a little questionable. Um, it all depends on the baby. And then uh, wanted to also let you know that uh, the new community development director will be starting on November 1. His name is Jim Tolbert. Um, he has over 30 years experience as a community development director and was previously the director at Sandy Springs, Georgia. Uh, one of the big projects he worked on there was relocation of the Mercedes-Benz U.S. headquarters and uh, also associated uh, residential projects similar to reunion in size. Our land use cases, uh, they are coming in the door as fast as they're going out of the door. And so we're still at 187 land use cases active. Uh, Stead School received their temporary certificate of occupancy on Friday and their first day of school was today for about 160 students. Uh, the emergency rental assistance uh, has been obligated to the point of $1,036,589. And so there's about 28% left for the emergency rental assistance round one. And of course, uh, round two uh, is available uh, starting next month. <clears throat> and then, um, Wanted to let you know that uh, there's the Active Adult Recognition Dinner on Thursday, October 14. And that's at six o'clock at the Bison Ridge Community Room. And 
Fall Fest will occur this coming Saturday, October 16. And that's from 10 in the morning until four in the afternoon uh, at Veterans Memorial Park and Eagle Point Recreation Center. And as I mentioned last week, Eagle Point will be closed for normal operations during this event. Um, police department, uh, I've met with uh, police department staff, um, had the first meeting last week and uh, went through, let's see, uh, four meetings with staff, followed up by uh, one meeting with command staff. Um, and then public works, uh, the streets uh, division, they're installing and repairing street signs, removing, removing graffiti, taking traffic counts in the Buffalo Run area, um, miscellaneous projects like that. Uh, pavement management has been completed except for reconstruction. As I mentioned before, uh, the 88th Avenue reconstruction is supposed to be happening uh, basically next week during the week. And uh, Jasmine is, is uh, gonna be happening basically a week later at the end of the month. They're also uh, working with CDOT on uh, reviewing a, another Chrissy grant application for 120th and Highway 85. And uh, so we anticipate getting another grant application in on that. Uh, in terms of devolution of 104th, we continue discussions with CDOT and uh, staff is evaluating their latest offer. And that would be for uh, the city taking over 104th between South Platte River and uh, basically Highway 2. And then uh, in terms of bridge replacements, the 112th Avenue bridge over the Fulton Ditch, uh, the concrete abutments uh, were poured previously and that project is on schedule. And then designs for the Potomac and Peoria streets are uh, completed and we anticipate the uh, construction to be finished uh, basically by the end of quarter one in 2022. So that's a real quick uh, summary. Any questions on any of that? Councilmember Noble. Yes, um, Mr. Tinklenberg, would it be possible for you to uh, have someone post the information that you provided to us about 6A and 6B on the city's website? Um, yes. I've had many residents ask, uh, you know, what the funds are going to be used for on that bond. And, uh, you know, the best way to answer, they say they go to the website and they can't find anything. So sooner the better would be really great. Okay, we will do. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, is that all you have for us this evening, sir? Yes, sir. All right, we'll move on to Mr. Sheasley. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a couple of notes for tonight. Um, I just want to thank you all. I know my announcement last week was sudden. Um, I want to work very hard over the next several weeks to make sure that I transition things well and that I prepare the office and you all for, for an interim successor. Um, I wanted to ask if council would be opposed to having an executive session at the end of the meeting next week to have a discussion on that related to personnel matters. Um, if, there, if there's no objection, I think that that's a wise thing to do to have that um, prepared and I'll, I'll, I'll share more at that time. So um, in addition, um, your plat ordinance that you requested is gonna be in the packet next week, requesting that uh, residential plats essentially come up to council for review. Um, I know that's generating a lot of interest, so there'll probably be substantial comment on that as well the um, ordinance on dumping fines uh, won't generate a lot of um, comment, I imagine. Um, but in response to the request from council for an ordinance, the municipal judge indicated that he was amending his fine schedule to match that. Um, so you already prompted action without uh, doing that, but I think you can still consider the ordinance um, to affect civil infractions. So some good news happening on that. front. That's uh, my report for now, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sheasley. Anybody have any comments or questions? Seeing none, thank you very much, sir. And uh, any council members wishing to make a report? Council Member Hurst. 
Yeah, I'd like to say uh, thank you for allowing me to um, participate in the Accelerate Colorado trip to DC last week. I believe it was a successful trip for not just Commerce City, but our our county, our neighboring county, Arapaho County, um, and some of our sister cities, if you will, that are that surround us and in the metro area. Um, we we got to uh, speak with and hear from uh, both of our senators as well as uh, several federal. Uh, agency representatives on uh, this administration's plans for moving forward and real Colorado issues um, that I think not only that we brought up, um, but were addressed in the presentations that we heard. Um, some of it are kind of hinging on votes and things like that. So it's, you know, there weren't promises, but there was discussion about policy and, and ideas. And I think, um, yeah, I also appreciate just the relationship building that allows for, um, for for me to make with some of our partnering cities, and I hope to um, you know introduce some of those folks that I met to other uh, council members and other staff members for Commerce City in the future, so we can uh, continue to build collaboration and partnerships in the region. Councilmember Noble. still off. I attended the AC rep um, meeting last week. Uh, I mentioned earlier about the enterprise zone tax credits, business tax credits that um, I hope businesses will take advantage of and nonprofits as well. Plus you can enhance your gift to a nonprofit if it happens to be located in um, an urban renewal area or an enterprise zone. So uh, keep that in mind as well. Um, I also attended the SIRSA webinar, or sorry, it was a seminar, we were there in person, um, on due process. And it was extraordinarily helpful in terms of the information that we learned about um, hearings that we uh, undertake, the um, quasi-judicial hearings that we do regarding uh, zoning and so forth. Um, in fact, I think that they were so beneficial that I would hope that uh, the whole city council could have him uh, come and speak to all of us um, to learn how to do it, how to ask questions during the hearings, uh, what kind of questions you can ask, what we could potentially ask for in terms of better um, um, notification of residents, uh, because Ty really goes to the runner. We shouldn't make it as difficult as we do for residents to know what's going on. Um, lots, lots and lots of ideas. So um, I hope that we can do that in the, in the future. Thank you very much. Council Member Smith. Thank you. Um, so on Saturday, I was able to go to the Battle of the Badges um, hockey game that you guys all support. And I just want to thank you guys for being supportive of that. And um, the first responders that were there were super thankful. And Jordan Long, who is the um, owner or person who started Revital, is just really thankful for the support for our first responders. So thank you for being willing to support that. Council Member Alan Thomas. Thank you, Mayor. Last Wednesday, I also attended the SIRSA um, training and like I said, found it very beneficial with the presentation that um, uh, the attorney Sam Light uh, gave us. So like I said, on due process was very helpful. Thank you. That's all I have. Any others? <clears throat> Seeing none, um, I spent uh, Wednesday through Friday in Minneapolis with the Community Leaders of America and had a great opportunity to share ideas from other council members and mayors from across the country. Uh, that is a conference that is actually paid for entirely by Community Leaders of America, so uh, no cost to the city, and I think a great benefit to be able to go out there and get some uh, some new ideas to bring back to Commerce City that we'll be working on in the future. Uh, Saturday evening also attended um, the Revital um, Battle of the Badges tournament, and uh, was a great opportunity to go out and support uh, not only the uh, 
police department and those officers that played on the police department team, but also the uh, first responders from around the metro region. And uh, I do have to say that the goalie, who I believe in Councilmember Smith can correct me if I'm wrong, the goalie as a Commerce City police officer was uh, very impressive with his skills out there as a goalie and as well as everybody else that played. So great event and thank you to Council for supporting that and supporting our first responders. That will conclude our study session. So we will adjourn the study session and move into our special session of the city council. Uh, we'll call the special meeting to order and ask the clerk to call the roll. Mayor Huseman. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Frank. Council member Madera. Present. Council member Alan Thomas. Present. Council member Noble. Present. Council member Wardiola. Present. Council member Hurst. Present. Council Member Grimes. Present. Council Member Smith. Present. Mayor Huseman, you have a quorum. Thank you. At this time, I'm looking for a motion and a second to excuse the member not present. Council Member Allen Thomas. So moved. Council Member Noble. Second. I have a motion and a second to excuse the member not present. Is there any discussion? Seeing no request for discussion, we'll do a voice vote. Please raise your physical hand in the chat window so your vote can be counted. And that'll pass unanimously eight to zero with one absence. First on the agenda is a proclamation declaring October 2021 as National Disability Employment Awareness Month. I'd like to ask the clerk to read the proclamation. Whereas October 2021 marks the 76th anniversary of National Disability Employment Awareness Month and whereas the purpose of National Disability Employment Awareness Month is to educate about disability employment issues and celebrate the many and varied contributions of America's workers with disabilities and whereas the history of National Disability Employment Awareness Month traces back to 1945 when Congress enacted a law declaring the first week of October each year National Employ the Physically Handicapped week and whereas in 1962 the word physically was removed to acknowledge the employment needs and contributions of individuals with all types of disabilities and whereas in 1988 congress expanded the week to a month and changed the name to national disability employment awareness month and whereas workplaces welcoming the talents of all people including people with disabilities are a critical part of our effort to build an inclusive community and strong economy and whereas activities during this month will reinforce the value and talent Talent, people with disabilities add to our workplaces and communities and affirm Karma City's commitment to an inclusive community that increases access and opportunities to all, including individuals with disabilities. Now, therefore, the City Council of Commerce City proclaims October 2021 as National Disability Employment Awareness Month and encourages all residents to join in celebrating our country's diversity and continue the efforts to create a world that is more just, peaceful, and prosperous for all. Thank you, Mr. Gibson. I'm looking for a motion and a second to approve the proclamation. Councilmember Allen Thomas. So moved. Councilmember Grimes. I'll second the motion. I have a motion and a second declaring October 2021 as National Disability Employment Awareness, Awareness Month in Commerce City. Is there any discussion? Councilmember Allen Thomas. That was a mistake. Okay. Um, so thank you, I appreciate uh, staff doing a quick turn on getting this proclamation done up. I think it's very important, uh, especially in today's age that we recognize that everybody brings something to the workforce and no matter what your ability is. And I know that the city council and the city has focused a lot on inclusivity lately and that most certainly also includes those with disabilities and just wanna say thank you for that. So that being said, all those in favor of approving the proclamation, please use your physical hands in the chat window so your vote can be counted. And that'll pass eight to zero with one absence. Next up, we have uh, an executive session on the um, agenda. So I'm looking for a motion and a second to enter into executive session pursuant to CRS 24-6-402 parentheses four parentheses F for the purposes of discussing personnel matters relating to the city manager's performance relating to oversight of the police department and to adjourn directly following the conclusion of the executive session. Council member Allen Thomas. So moved. Council Member Smith. Second. I have a motion and a second to enter into executive session. Is there any discussion? Council Member Madera. Yeah, I think last week I had the, the same comment. Um, you know, the city manager reports to all of city council and we don't have all of city council present. So for that reason, I'll be um, not in support. Council Member Hurst. 
can I understand the intention? I, I, I know nothing about, I know nothing about anything. There's been no report back from the only thing I've ever been made aware of. Uh, this was put in as a request from council member Noble. So I'll defer to you to explain your reason for the executive session. Absolutely. Um, we received information um, by email that uh, certainly was something that uh, was a personnel matter that uh, the city council could take should take a look at. Um, and I was told that I couldn't just ask for a um, executive session on that topic specifically, that it had to be about Mr. Tinklenberg. It wasn't specifically about Mr. Tinklenberg. It just was the way it had to be addressed. I don't anticipate it will take any particular length of time. It was just something that uh, needed to be uh, discussed and addressed so that we would uh, be aware. Thanks. Councilmember Wadiola. Thank you, Mayor. I would agree with uh, Councilmember Madera. Are we gonna fill in our colleague that is out today? Because I think this is an important uh, matter um, that all nine of us should be there to hear, to discuss. Having her gone, um, I don't think it'd be fair for any action in the future, if there's any action to be taking place for her not to be involved. So. Um, again, I, uh, I won't be voting for this because of our colleague that's gone. Mr. Tinklenberg. The uh, decision whether to do it without one of your colleagues is certainly yours. I just wanted to let you know that I'm fine with going into executive session. Um, I just simply you know, want to be present when, when we have a discussion, obviously, uh, since it involves me and uh, also have the city attorney there, but the decision is up to you in terms of whether you proceed uh, without her or, or wait until, until she is able to join, but I welcome the opportunity, so. Any other discussion? While I uh, certainly understand the desire to have all nine of us present, this is the second meeting in a row that that individual has missed. And if we keep, keep kicking the can down the road, then the issue no longer becomes relevant. So therefore I will still vote in favor of the executive session this evening. And uh, at this time we'll do a voice vote. Please use your physical hands in the chat window if you're in favor of going into executive session. And it looks like that is going to fail four to four. So at that point, case. We will adjourn the meeting. Have a good night. Have a good week.